Welcome to everybody who's here with us and those who are listening in online. We're pleased to have all of you here because this seems like to be this seems to be a very important topic and I think we'll have a very interesting discussion. I'll be the moderator this afternoon. I'm Carol Harden. I chair the Geographical Sciences Committee here at the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And the people sitting in this inner horseshoe table are members of the Geographical Sciences Committee. So I think we'll take just a second and ask each one of them to speak into their microphone just to tell you their name and their institution so you'll know who we have here. Marilyn, why don't we begin with you? I am a Regents Professor and um, Brooke Byers Professor of Sustainable Systems at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, hello, I'm Glenn McDonald from UCLA. Budu Haduri from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Nancy Jackson from New Jersey Institute of Technology. This is Carol Laney from the Geographical Sciences Committee on the staff side, and um, we're also, Michael Jarrett is with us, but he's out of the room at the moment. He is also at UCLA. Uh, Bill Selecki, uh, Hunter College, City University of New York. Andrew Turner, ESRI. Okay, thank you. Um, and Carol Harden, Professor Emerita of the University of Tennessee, Geography Department. The Geographical Sciences Committee that is us. Our main objective is to identify ways in which the geographical sciences can best help the nation solve important problems. And one of the things we've been discussing this year is, is the issue of coastal flooding, um, coastal flooding from sea level rise, from inundation, from storms. And we've certainly seen a number of examples of that this year. Um, one of the, as we look at coastal flooding, there are many things to be worried about, and one of them is energy infrastructure, something that we often take too much for granted, but then suddenly when we don't have it, um, we collapse in place, basically. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a national climate assessment report that was released. I think you'll all remember it was released on Black Friday. Um, some of us were home all day, so we had a chance to read it. <laughs> and and one, of the, one of the sentences that really rang true from that to me was that the reliability, security, and resilience of the energy system underpin virtually every sector of the U.S. economy. Cascading impacts on other critical sectors could affect economic and national security. So this is, this is, big, this is, this is a big, very important issue our issue of the vulnerability of the U.S. energy infrastructure to coastal flooding. We've already seen various kinds of coastal flooding from the nuisance flooding, um, spring tides, high tides, um, storm surges. Remember the Hurricane Florence just this past fall that came to North Carolina and just parked there and rained and rained for days with over 30 inches of rain in some places. So it's not only about the ocean, there is terrestrial-based flooding that we're worried about. And then on the Pacific, especially on the Pacific side, we still have the possibility of tsunami inundation, um, and most particularly along the area of the Cascadia subduction zone. We've already seen that the cost of repairs to our electricity generation system and the transmission and the distribution systems are in the, are in the billions of dollars just per event. So the, again, this is, has tremendous economic impact. The task of our committee is to identify research gaps and to anticipate problems that our government, will, our nation will face and to then conduct studies or hold workshops or find, help find the information that will be necessary for solving those problems or addressing those problems. And that's our task here today as we think about this topic. The committee posed three questions as we planned for this meeting. The first one 
is the science question, what, a diff what additional scientific knowledge is needed to support efforts to reduce flood damage to coastal energy infrastructure? And the second and third question really support that. In order to understand what science is needed, we need to know what the impacts are likely to be and will they affect large geographical areas or persist for substantial periods of time? And then the third question, do we know the relative importance of different ports, production and distribution systems, and the extent of the ripple effects of damage? Are, are those well understood? What do we not understand? What do we need to understand? We've invited three experts to meet with us this afternoon, and I'll address them each in turn. Those will be our panelists. Before they speak, one of our committee members, Dr. Marilyn Brown, will give an introductory presentation. We'll have uh, the introduction and two of our speakers, and then we'll take a short break around three o'clock, come back in after we've stretched, and have our third speaker. And then we have uh, over an hour budgeted to, for a discussion, and the discussion will include the panelists, the people at the table, anybody else in the room. I encourage everybody, at the, both our uh, committee members and also the people in the audience, to use a microphone when you speak. And there is a microphone we can pass around in the audience. <laughs> Remy's waving it in the back. Uh, just so that, that we can all hear each other and the people online can hear the questions too. Be before we begin, I'd like to put in a small shameless plug for the event that our committee is hosting tomorrow afternoon in the same building. And that is that Dr. Don Wright, who is Chief Scientist of Environmental Systems Research Institute, better known to some of you as ESRI, will deliver this year's Gilbert White Lecture in, here in, in this building of the National Academies. It will be at 3.30 on Friday tomorrow afternoon. And her title is A Turn to the Territories Featuring a Cautionary Tale of the 2009 American Samoa Tsunami. Okay, now for back to today. Our introductory speaker will be Dr. Marilyn Brown. She's Regents Professor and Brooke Byers Professor of Sustainable Systems in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech and a member of our Geographical Sciences Committee. Before moving to Georgia Tech, she worked at the US Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Her research, which emphasizes the electric utility industry, focuses on policies designed to accelerate the development of sustainable energy technologies, including ways to improve resiliency to disruptions. She has hundreds of publications, including three books, most recently in 2016, Fact and Fiction in Global Energy Policy from Johns Hopkins University Press. She's provided testimony to committees of both the US House of Representatives and the Senate and she served on the Department of Energy's Electric Electricity Advisory Committee, and she's been a presidential appointee to the Board of Directors of the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. We didn't budget time for questions uh, for her introductory remarks, but if you could hold those, we can talk about those during the discussion. So, Marilyn Brown. Uh, thank you, Carol, for the introductory remarks. And um, Remy, will I be able to see the slides on the uh, monitor here? That would be helpful. <laughs> Can we see them over there as well? <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, one we're getting... I'm, I'm working on it. Sorry okay. for the delay. All right, thank you. Well, we're getting that uh, set up. Yeah, as Carol mentioned, um, Essential components of the energy infrastructure are located along uh, coastlines in the United States and around the globe. And with sea level rise and increasingly numerous and severe um, weather events, we have uh, need, the Geographical Sciences Committee concluded, to ask what we know and what knowledge do we need to know to better deal with the vulnerability of our energy systems. Um, I'm going to start first from a, a global context to um, put it all into perspective. 
long-term global context. Well, let's talk about what might happen perhaps by the year 2200 or later. Uh, we have um, the potential for the melting of the ice sheets in Greenland and the Antarctica. Um, estimates of the potential sea level rise from those occurrences range from six to seven meters for the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, six to eight uh, meter rise for uh, melting of the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, and thank you, uh, 65 to 67 meters for um, melting of the East Antarctic ice sheet. So put that all together and you have the possibility of an estimate of, of a rise of about 80 meters. So that would be catastrophic, especially if it were to be sudden, and I would call 2200 sudden. Um, fortunately, um, all but a few major cities would be inundated and uh, 136 port cities with over a million people would be inundated with that type of a sea level rise. Uh, fortuitously, global warming does not appear to offer the kind of heat that would melt all of the ice sheets suddenly. So the next century or two, perhaps we won't be there. Um, and indeed, all of the official forecasts suggest that by the end of this century, uh, we'll have a rise in the range of 0.3 to 1 meters, although there are estimates that extend higher. Um, with one, a one meter forecast for the year 2100, there is time to adapt and to mitigate. So that's principally the focus of, of my few introductory <laughs> remarks. Um, if we don't adapt and mitigate, here's where we, we may be. Here's New York City under 80 meters, uh, thanks to Google Earth map. And here's San Francisco. Uh, under um, water mostly with 80 meter sea level rise. Um, so as we look the short, um, as we look in the short term at possible measures, we do need to keep in mind the long-term game plan, which could involve, for instance, barricading the Mediterranean or putting a um, physical dam uh, to harp to uh, dam the San Francisco Bay at the Golden Gate Bridge. We may need to retreat entirely from our coastal um, cities. There's a real lack of information and estimates about what the cost of such a significant uh, type of protective devices and retreat would be. There is one fellow at Stanford um, Delavane Diaz that has put together a coastal impact assessment model and published a report in 2014 that has some pretty good numbers, I thought. Um, his uh, estimate is based on, I think it's 12,000 um, physical sites that are coastal along the edges of um, our continents around the world. And he had a um, sort of summarize the formula for the costs that he attempts to minimize to determine what types of protection versus retreat should be invested in. And uh, he tallies up the protection costs, the retreat costs, the inundation, the wetland and the flooding costs. And he concludes that these are the best actions to be taken around the world to deal with the prospect of one meter rise in sea level. So he focuses in on you know, what is today considered one of the principal um, uh, scenario forecasts. And interestingly, in his analysis, he concludes that retreat is often more cost effective than protect, given the magnitude of the um, investment that would be required to protect our uh, coastal infrastructure at one meter rise. So now pulling it back down from a few centuries and global to where we are today and what might happen here in the United States, we can turn to a, an analysis that was done 
um, by Robert Coppett, Rutgers and his team there. It was released about a year ago, I, th I think two years ago, 2016. And he looks at, again, a nearly a one meter rise in the US and estimates the impacted population on the coast of the, of the US by county and concludes that a 0.9 meter rise um, and sea level would impact 4 million or more people. A rise of 1.8 million would impact 13.1 million. He doesn't have an estimate of the uh, impact of facilities and energy um, investments on the coast, unfortunately. So he does uh, talk about the magnitude of um, population movement that might be precipitated by these types of um, inundations to the U.S. coastline and compares it to the magnitude of the 20th century great migration of uh, Southern African Americans north. So what facilities are at risk? There have been some um, inventories. We found uh, an analysis by Strauss and Zemlinski that documents 287 coastal energy facilities in the U.S. that are within four feet of ordinary high tide that would be vulnerable. And these include things like uh, natural gas infrastructure, power plants, oil and gas refineries. We talked about uh, the Gulf um, region this morning in our uh, closed meeting and the, some of the vulnerabilities that it uh, might experience. Uh, onshore coastal energy infrastructure isn't uh, just uh, about these investments, but includes the allied sort of feeder supply chain system, rail, highways, pipelines, etc. And here's where those uh, coastal facilities are located that Strauss and Zelensky uh, identified. So you can see the cluster in Louisiana in particular with the greatest number of them, but there are something like um, uh, five or six other states that have you know, at least 10 or so facilities as well. So we've learned a little bit from our hurricane experiences of late. Uh, one lesson from the uh, hurricanes Rita and Katrina experience is that the oil industry um, has learned that closures of gas processing plants were caused not only by flooding, but also because of, again, this uh, supply chain, lack of electricity and accessibility to um, freight, uh, road damage, and other supply chain disruptions. So looking a little bit more closely at the state of Florida, which is usually highlighted again as a high risk state in most studies, uh, this um, particular analysis indicates that it's the state that's most vulnerable to rising sea levels in terms of populations, standing just a few feet above the current um, level. It's an especially, in an especially dangerous position because of its limestone foundation so um, in one of the books that uh, Carol mentioned that was published in 2016, we did an analysis and really took existing information about the vulnerabilities of uh, different cities around the world. And one of them was um, Miami. And we asked the question, um, what a kind of supply uh, chain, uh, what kind of uh, supply curve of adaptation options exist to deal with sea level rise in Florida at large? So the way you look at this uh, supply um, curve is along the, um, the dotted line are actions where you can avert loss at no cost, right? Everything below that dotted line is a no cost or negative cost investment. And above that line are investments that are simply going to cost you. 
in looking across the cities and states and countries that we did these uh, supply curves for, most of them had a lot of white space. That is, things you could do that made sense. They offered double dividends. They weren't just going to help you avert future losses from drought or flooding, but they were also going to save you money. Here, most of the investments are going to cost you in terms of protecting the uh, Florida coast. There are in this uh, inventory of actions a number of energy um, uh, resilience investments that you might not have thought of, uh, that we really need to do a better job inventorying. Some of them are quite small, but they're numerous. Every substation, they need to have some backup, more backup generation. Uh, transmission and distribution lines, burying them where possible, protecting them underground, of course, more and more expensive, and particularly in uh, limestone a foundation state like Florida. Uh, so some of the investments are not that expensive, like targeted um, distribution and transmission uh, underground investments, but for the most part, those tall black bars are what you need to pay for if you're going to take all of your T&D and put it uh, underground. A very significant investment. So one of the areas that um, appears to be increasingly um, promising as a way to um, protect our energy infrastructure, particularly in the electricity sector, is to move to a more distributed electric grid. And in fact, that's what we're doing uh, in any event because of the um, declining costs of solar and uh, energy efficiency and demand response with a smart grid, with um, electric vehicles and all sorts of distributed storage, we're seeing an, a possible future where we're no longer uh, so vulnerable to single uh, infrastructure site catastrophes. This was illustrated after Superstorm Sandy when the, there was um, a significant amount of power that powered through the storm from combined heat and power systems all over the downstate region. So they had, they were off grid, they could island, they were like a, a microgrid. They were able to continue to provide power to critical facilities like, like hospitals and, and uh, key, key data centers. So we know from that experience that distributed energy can help keep the lights on and, and certainly some instances would be a an investment that could pay off in, in multiple dividends. And uh, just in uh, thinking about trends in the industry at large, we have an evolving business where we spoke this morning about the investments in uh, infrastructure across all sectors of uh, the economy. Well, in the energy sector and the electricity sector in particular, we're seeing investments being made by individuals, by individual firms and individual um, households. We have the, you know, Airbnb, the largest realtor now in the world that doesn't actually own <laughs> any real estate. It just uses the real estate that we all, oops, that we all own and Airbnb similarly. So that kind of a model is emerging in the electric um, uh, space and including the transportation, electrification of transportation. I have this question here, open for smart business in my garage, you know, uh, if you're in the neighborhood, you need to charge up. I got my solar panel and my EV and I can recharge you and you know, maybe I'll make that into a business. I think that we can do a lot with a new um, emerging sharing economy that can spread the cost of infrastructure investments to individuals and firms that will benefit for themselves and also can offer solutions for others. So this distributed energy system, 
uh, can provide a climate resilient development pathway. We need to look more closely at the extent to which it can supplant in large part the existing uh, infrastructure and provide greater um, protection against coastal uh, sea level rise at the same time. So those were my introductory remarks. And now we'll turn to the, the real experts in the field that we've invited to come in from out of town. Our first panelist is Dr. Frank Felder. He is research professor and director of the Center for Energy, Economic, and Environmental Policy at Rutgers University. He also directs the Rutgers Energy Institute and the pub public informatics program there. Dr. Felder holds a PhD in technology management and policy from MIT. His research and teaching interests include the reliability and economics of electricity markets, state energy policy, energy efficiency, and renewable energy evaluation, and integrated energy modeling. Before joining the Rutgers University faculty, Professor Felder taught management at the Manhattan School of Business. He's also worked as an economic consultant and served as a nuclear engineer in the U.S. Navy and just to brag, because I can do this for him, um, when he was in the Navy, he was twice awarded the Navy Achievement Medal. The title of his presentation is Climate Change, Coastal Flooding, and the Electric Power Grid. Dr. Kelvin. We'll have our speakers stand up here when we speak, but then I think in the discussion we'll Great, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Carol and the committee for having me. Um, so my understanding is I have about 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of questions and then so forth. So hopefully I'll stay on track here. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, talk about the electric power grid. I'm gonna kind of back up and uh, discuss what I think are some uh, fundamental characteristics about how it works, how it's structured, how it's planned. Um, so we have a, a, a decent framework and then we can, both in the discussion and part of this presentation and the other uh, presentations, delve into more particular issues and specific questions and research gaps that the committee uh, may find of use. So one, the motivation, I won't spend much time on that. I think the topic motivates itself. I think uh, Marilyn did a, a great job uh, with that. Um, I do want to talk about how the grid works, both at the physics, it has characteristics that are very different from other products that really will violate your intuition across many different uh, domains. And that's just integral to understanding how it works and how it responds uh, to policies, to new technologies, to severe events, extreme events such as the weather events and chronic events like, or uh, such as climate change. Um, but the same thing applies to its governance and policies. We have this this framework where we need to, at the same time, think about the physics, uh, the economics, and the policy together, because they all work hand in glove. I, I wish I had a better analogy, because that's only two things, but whatever, hand, glove, and pocket, I'm not sure. Um, in any event, um, but as also alluded to, or even mentioned uh, by uh, Marilyn, the grid um, is central to the rest of the infrastructure system. If you lose the power grid, not only do you notice because of loss of electricity, but you lose or potentially lose parts of the oil industry, natural gas, uh, telecommunications, financial system, uh, safety, um, public health systems, and so forth. So it has this immediate uh, uh, impact. And then I'll try to set up to my talk, and I'm looking forward to the other talks and the discussion of what are the scientific engineering public policy advances that are needed in this context, the committee's mandate or remit uh, to respond to climate change. Something I did wrong? I'm trying to advance this slide, am I? Did I? I'm sorry, try now, thank you. So the takeaway uh, message um, in terms of the analysis is an integrated approach is required um, really across the domain from the engineering, economics, policy, um, and even in the business because much of the electric power system in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world is under a, a different business models and understanding how those business models work and don't work and how they interact uh, with everything else is very important. 
Although uh, you may have heard a lot about, particularly in recent times, about, quote, deregulations of the power sector or competition, even under the most, I don't want to say extreme, but the most uh, deregulated model, so to speak, the electric supply chain is highly regulated. Two-thirds of it, in a sense, the transmission and distribution are regulated under our cost of, of service a model. Um, the U.S., just to compound the problem, has basically two different architectures of how we run uh, the grid. Um, and that affects, if you even look on the coastal piece, so in the northwest, at northeast, for example, it's a RTO, regional transmission organization type model, very market-based. Uh, the models were developed out of MIT and Harvard um, a while back. Um, but in other places, for example, in the south, it has a different model. So that business model, which is an artifact or drives from the regulatory model, that needs to be brought into this integration of the analysis of the impacts of severe weather, for example, on climate change. The industry is undergoing the most fundamental changes it's had since its inception. It's slow moving, so it's like watching paint dry or C-SPAN in slow motion. Nonetheless, as Marilyn's talk really did a good job of highlighting is the fundamental questions of what the industry is supposed to do, what's its technological basis, its transition, or should it transition from a central to more decentralized, um, and the role of markets versus regulation are all up there. So the grid supply chain is very complicated. This slide doesn't do it justice because up in the top, I guess, uh, your left-hand corner, it looks very linear. A to B to C. It's a network, as you'll see in the next, at least particularly at the grid level, generation and transmission. Um, just to give you a sense of the U.S., a, a little bit of data in terms of the cost and how they're split among the three major components of the system, generation, transmission, and distribution, but we should also add in a load if you're an engineer or demand if you want to think about it at the economics. So the lower picture gives you an idea of the network, starts to look like a highway system. Electricity moves in accordance with Kirchhoff's laws. Um, it moves very quickly uh, to kind of stretch uh, the actual uh, physics. But um, what happens at one part of the grid affects the rest of the power system. So it's not la like Las Vegas, with what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. That's not the case. A problem in Florida on the grid, and I've gotten calls of it like five or six years ago, five to eight years ago, there was an outage in Florida, and rightly so, uh, the New Jersey news services were interested or worried or concerned um, whether or not that would affect the availability of electricity in New Jersey and elsewhere. The system has a time scale that you can only measure or should only be measured on a log scale from fractions of a second to 10 to the minus six, you know, uh, two or three hertz, the system is sensing itself and taking protective actions all the way up to decades to build and site power plants, um, transmission lines, and so forth. And the system requires to be balanced in real time or almost all real time all the time. So if you think of just in time inventory systems like Walmart or uh, of auto manufacturers, they have nothing compared to the time step, the inst almost instantaneous nature of the electric power grid. Um, just to show, there's a link of video, which I won't show in the interest of time, uh, but the system is balanced in the U.S. at 60 hertz, really North America. Um, supply and demand have to be in balance. Think of hertz as the frequency of the system, as the pulse of the system, and it has to be maintained very, very close to 60 hertz to prevent these cascading outages or what you and I would call blackouts. With the addition of uh, renewables, wind and solar, um, and combined with this physical fact that we have to uh, balance supply and demand, you have potentially, and this is the infamous California duck curve, um, uh, requirements that the system has to respond to changes in wind, solar, and demand, and always be balanced. And now that would be balanced by thermal power plants, coal, natural gas, there's a little bit of oil. Storage is coming online, but still, as the costs are declining, it's still a large scale, is not cost competitive. So typically the way we store electricity is not as electricity, but as water behind a dam, uh, coal out of coal power plant, gas packed in a, a, a transportation uh, pipeline, um, and, and so forth. Um, and then we use that fuel when we need it. We convert it to electricity in real time. This scale, the previous chart was on the daily basis. This extends it to a wind, uh, I'm sorry, a weekly basis, and then divides it into winter and summer, of course, or spring and fall as well. 
So the way I like to characterize the electric power system, it's a sports car, it has to have the maneuverability, the acceleration, the deacceleration, the lane changing of a sports car, but it's pulling the load of an 18 uh, wheeler uh, Mack truck. Um, and by the way, if one of the wheels uh, blows out for whatever reason, you still need to go down, down the highway at your speed. You don't get to pull off to the side and replace the wheel and say, well, you know, smoke them if you got them um, and, and wait. Uh, so it's just a very uh, amazing system. The National Academies of Engineer, Engineering refers to the power system, the electric grid, as the greatest invention of the 20th century, which I think is pretty amazing given what else was invented in the 20th century. But we're now starting to see many of the consequences of, of those decisions in that grid. As a result, it requires, whether you have a market-based or not, um, a control, a control system. So this is the uh, control system for New England, which is a market attached to the rest of the Eastern interconnection um, to maintain uh, this balancing, to plan out the next five minutes in the dispatch hour, unit commitment over 24 hours, responding to emergencies, changes in the system, and so forth. Fuels for electricity are changing uh, dramatically, although it's slow moving with the introduction of fracking for natural gas, although it also affects oil, which really isn't electricity play, but important in broader context. Uh, we're switching natural gas has been replacing coal, primarily, not exclusively, primarily due to the relative decrease difference between the price of natural gas and coal. Natural gas units, particularly their newer ones, are more efficient than older coal plants. So you get that dual benefit, a more efficient power production, a lower input price, and um, natural gas is replacing coal. There's been some environmental reasons, uh, regulatory reasons as well, but it's really the change in uh, prices between coal and gas for the most part. Up here on the top hand, left hand side, it's hard to see, but that blue band at the very top is the percentage of coal in the uh, in that you, is used to generate electricity, and it's roughly gone from 50% before we had major fracking in 2006 to about 40% uh, now. And then you see the rest of the, <coughs> of the pieces. And that uh, trend is projected to continue. The power system is linked to um, other systems as well. And here the slide is not to get too busy, but to show its link to the natural gas system in terms of prices. Um, so what happens in the natural gas system affects the power system and vice versa. CO2 emissions have been coming down primarily to the switch from uh, coal to uh, natural gas. You get a twofer, so to speak. Um, and then natural gas doesn't have the sulfur emissions uh, that coal does. So you have those emissions as well. So it's, it's coupled to the uh, natural gas system and to our air quality, among other systems and subsystems. Federal policy, and in addition to state policy, but here the slide is emphasizing the federal policy affects the grid. What I like about this chart or this graphic is it links various legislations over the last 60 or so years with the change in uh, new capacity additions, generation capacity additions. So policies, not surprisingly, were intended to get certain results. And of course, you got unintended consequences as well. And today we're living as a result or the system that we have is built up versus these policies. And these policies haven't always gone through a consistent trajectory. They've gone back and forth at events and uh, changes in the economy, changes in our understanding of environmental impacts, changes our, our built up experience with the nuclear power industry as well. With the electric power system in the US, and uh, this is not unique to the US, but maybe the US is one of the most pronounced cases, uh, the governance of the grid is overlapping and layered. It's governed the transmission and generation system with the exception of most of Texas by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission due to the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. At the state level, it governs the distribution system, even though it's an integrated uh, supply chain. So you have competing and sometimes contradictory uh, policies between the states and the regions or the government, federal government which is plain itself. But in addition, there are entities that are not FERC regulated. Um, so they are doing their things. And then there's these different layers, for example, the, the market administrators and grid operators in certain regions for the regional transmission operators and independent system operators. So it's really a patchwork of overlapping and layer organizations and governance. And that makes changing the industry in addition to the large sunk cost uh, uh, slow and difficult. The technology, as Marilyn pointed out, is changing uh, dramatically. 
Um, there are many, many open questions on, first of all, whether we should go down this route, to what extent, how do we integrate all this, who owns the data, who owns your meter, why can't my meter be my, like my phone, I own it, not the utility company, how does my meter talk to everything else in my um, uh, house, including my children, um, and how do we do this in a way that's safe, it's secure, and it uh, furthers the objectives that um, we're trying to do. So I'll wait for a picture. I'll be happy to send out the slides to anyone who asks as well. Our notions of reliability and resiliency are being extended. In the old world, they were defined in very uh, limited, I, I would say limited, but very uh, standardized way throughout the industry. Um, there were different definitions at the distribution and the wholesale side, um, but in any event, those notions are being expanded, and this is one of the points that the theory and the conceptual understanding, the definitions of many of these terms um, need to be revisited given the context of our situation. New York is one example, not the only example, of a state that's really pushing to kind of upside down or revert or um, swap from a centralized system to a decentralized system. It's called Reforming the Energy Vision, or REV. Depending on your point of view, it's either the French or the American Revolution. But in the event, um, what's nice, although one disadvantage of our federal system is states can you know, row in different directions from the federal government, that may be an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on your view, but it's also the laboratory of democracy, to, so to speak. So we can see New Jersey can wait, for example, or uh, Colorado, whatever, wait and see what happens in New York. We can do a different path and then we can learn from those experiences. So that is an advantage where we can have this kind of a laboratory actually out in the, the state. Um, I'll, I'll motivate this quickly, but storms um, uh, definitely impact the electric power industry. It's not a coincidence that power plants are located near water. Just think about cities. Most major cities are located in water before we had fossil fuel. How did we move stuff around via water? It's very inexpensive. We still do that today. So if you want to move something heavy slowly, you want to do it on water. Um, but once we uh, develop fossil fuels and the electric power grid, um, we then uh, replaced that infrastructure. Factories were located near water. Water was also used to uh, complete the thermodynamic cycle of the electric power grid. But now we uh, wake up and we find uh, all the implications that Maryland laid out, or many of the implications that Maryland laid out a moment ago. New Jersey is not the only example, but it's, um, it's certainly uh, one example, and we emphasize compared to, to other states. Reliability and resiliency are the buzzwords uh, today. Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Sometimes they're used as two sides of the same coin. Reliability as preventing an unwanted uh, outcome in the context of electricity, electric power outages. Resiliency is how quickly you respond, although the definitions are, um, I don't think there's a, a, a complete consistency on which types of definitions are important. The difficulty of thinking about reliability and resiliency, even before you get to the economics, the cost effectiveness is difficult because of the uncertainty. Um, there's uncertainty in data. The type of data we're talking about or events are generally low probability, high consequence. By definition, we don't have many of those events because they're low probability. And so our estimates of the probabilities have large un uncertainty. We, of course, need to think about cost effectiveness. There's just not a enough money around to do everything we need to do just with respect to the grid, the electric grid, let alone all the other energy infrastructure, let alone health, education, um, just in the climate change, let alone all the other priorities of society. So in my mind, there's this notion of cost effectiveness needs to be considered and built into our understanding and modeling and analysis of these questions. But with the power system and elsewhere, it also needs to be put in the context of policy and governance considerations um, because the policies affect the business models, the regulatory models, how the system is govern governed, who makes the decisions, why they make those decisions, what are the real decisions, what are the real criteria, and then, of course, that flows through the economics. So you may ask, well, why don't we just do cost-benefit analysis of utility hardening as a sub-problem of all this? I think Marilyn hit some of the uh, issues. She set it up well. There are different strategies. Uh, there's large uncertainties about these strategies. Many of these strategies we haven't tried. We just have them on paper, So, and they need to be intertwined or they interact with the policy um, uh, issues that I discussed. Um, 
And formally, this problem has large uncertainty. The data and models are, my view of that current understanding, these models are evolving and incomplete. They're useful, but they need to be made uh, better. Um, and in many types, the cost-benefit analyses, um, there's a disproportionate ability to quantify some things and not be able to quantify other things. And so both in terms of just analysis like us, that creates difficulties, but also in terms of communicating that and uh, to in an informed decision making um, uh, to broader policymakers or to policymakers is a challenge. The uncertainty itself is uncertain, but particularly with respect to uh, climate change. So my, one of my former professors uh, had this distinction between aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. Aleatory uncertainty is rolling the dice. We don't know what will come up. We have well-defined uh, probability rules to get to estimate the probability distribution function. But epistemic is our fundamental knowledge is uncertain. And that makes it even more difficult because we're not even sure if we're rolling a die or flipping a coin or playing Dungeons and Dragons or spinning a roulette wheel. One example, not the only, is uh, predicting the severe, uh, the tracks. So even if you know a storm is coming, even if you know what size it will be when it hits New Jersey or elsewhere, just predicting the track and a slight deviation from the track can mean the, uh, the difference between a major and a, a, a problem and a near miss. You add on to this, these notions of it's not how long, just whether or not an outage will occur, but it's duration, it's magnitude, how many that will occur. Um, can we use data now to project to 2100? Probably not because the underlying phenomena at the climate scale are changing. And then how do we value if we're gonna go down this cost benefit route or this economic efficiency route of those costs? Even on, I mean, this is a well-studied field, the value of lost load, how much someone would be willing to pay uh, to not have an outage of electricity. It varies by industry, it varies by application, but also varies by the study methodology. It varies by season, time of day. There's just lots of uncertainty, but there's no way around this problem. You can either close your eyes and pretend the problem, the answer is zero, which is wrong, or it's really, really high, it's infinite, that's wrong too. You have to make some decision, and we have to think about that and, and bring that into our modeling capabilities. Um, but there's even another wrinkle, people behave strategically, right? So if I am a installer of a combined heat and power facility, I think strategically about the regulations at the state and federal level. I build my or not build my combined heat and power or backup supply or whatever in that context, in that economic context. And that makes the analysis even uh, more uh, uh, challenging. The grid is not only susceptible to a weather, severe weather and flooding, you know, changes in the climate, but also particular weather events. And so this is just one example, the linkage to the natural gas system. Changes in pressure on the natural gas system can then trip multiple power plants at the same time. And that is beyond kind of the current framework, although that's being uh, rectified to some extent in terms of how we think of reliability on the grid and how we plan and operate the system. Just to drive the point home, um, I know it's a little bit kind of uh, self-promoting to put electricity at the center of the universe, um, but when, you, when you're without it, <laughs> you think a lot about it. Um, but it really is in terms of, at least in my view, in terms of the critical infrastructure. Um, and we've all lived it, right? We all remember days we didn't have electricity. We don't remember days when we did, right? Except for today, right? Um, and it just links, I haven't mentioned water. I know there's uh, some talks coming up in expertise in water, the financial system, um, you know, oil, everything is, is linked to electricity. And the technologies that are pushing transformation of the grid are more electric based, right? So solar, wind, so, you know, we're, and extending the grid to transportation, it don't, in my mind, may only further the dependence on the electric grid. Findings with respect to grid and coastal flooding, I didn't mean to do it this way, which is annoying. Um, so first is, um, and I'd be interested in the committee's views and discussion, uh, we really need to think in an integrated manner, technology economic policy must be considered hand in glove. Uh, the government and private actors behave strategically. States think about their federal policy or what the federal policy is and react accordingly. That's uh, a new area, or I think an important area that, and that needs to be addressed. Um, we need better data and quantitative models across the system, not just of the grid, but the interconnection of the grid. So think of the previous slide. 
You need better data on trans, uh, translating changes in climate change to severity and frequency of storms, partic particularly coastal storms. We need to think about the interaction of large-scale wind farms on regional and global climates. It, at a large enough scale, it's two ways, or could be two ways, where that boundary is, um, but certainly changes in the climate will affect large-scale wind farms that are on the planning phase to last for the next 20 to 40 or, or so years. And we always need better data and models and theory and integrating uh, them. That's a challenge when much of the sector is privately based uh, because data has business uh, confidentiality. Uh, it's important for a, a role for public uh, data sets. We can respect confidentiality of certain data so that the scientists and the researchers uh, can uh, bring those data to bear, improve their models, and serve the public. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Do we have questions here in the room? If you have a question um, and you're at the table, you might, you might tilt up your, your name card. And if you have a question in the room, just raise your hand and we'll Pass the microphone around. I think we're all uh, we're we're, di we're processing. Yeah, that was a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I I I I'm um, intrigued with this last um, topic of better data and quantitative models, right? Um, and this came up in our earlier discussion today. Uh, do you have specific thoughts about where these should come from? Yes, I do. Um, and it'll be multiple sources. So for example, at the state level, since states are a major driver, many states have a major initiative um, with respect to the electric power grid, solar, offshore wind, and uh, energy efficiency. Marilyn talked about demand response and so forth. So a lot can be obtained from those state programs Whereas when they go out and have a program to fund this or to provide grants for that as a condition of the recipient, which is typically a company who specializes in one of those areas, is to provide a data that can protect the commercial value, but still be available both for policymakers so they can improve the program down the line, but also um, uh, with respect to researchers and academics. At the state, at the federal level, the, you know, I cited many EIA, Energy um, Information Administration data. Having that data is just important because it just sets the context and the reports that have been alluded to by both Carol and uh, Marilyn that provide a baseline and data set. So the federal government has a huge role. I mean, think of just this building itself or, um, in that. Um, with the advent um, for the last 20 years or so in terms of the internet, the low cost of data storage, this whole notion of big data, public informatics, urban informatics, data analytics is just uh, critical. Um, not to go too overboard, we need to be cautious just because I have a large data set doesn't mean it's representative or it's not missing or it's not reflecting something that um, I need to, we need to think about. So I think it's a multi-level effort in terms of, but at the core is, state and federal government, because I don't blame industry. If they're not required to provide the data, they won't. They have other, they're going to do other things, particularly for public consumption. But I can provide the committee at a later date more specifics to that. So, so I want to add one thing, which is um, this divide between the public and private data set seems to create a major gap for researchers um, at the end of the day. So. Should we start thinking about a public-private partnership around data so everybody can benefit? Because the utilities or the private entities have as much stake in this as the state and federal government. Absolutely. Let me. I'll be brief. A, a quick example: New Jersey, like many states, is trying to develop an offshore wind industry. The initial wind farms will be subsidized, perhaps rightly so, paid for by ratepayers, by you and I, or people in New Jersey, or equivalents of billions of dollars. The establishment of those wind farms, their locations, the towers, the wind turbines, the collection of weather data and climate data, because if you have a turbine, you're gonna have a data, weather data sensors, needs to be integrated or should be integrated into uh, short-term weather forecasting, long-term weather forecasting, climate change model. If we're building these systems, wind farms, due to climate change, we should feed back the data that we get 
into the, the modeling and the analyses to improve the sea level ride estimates and so forth. That can be done in a way that protects the confidentiality, but allows researchers at Rutgers or whatever, pick your, uh, to do those analyses. And that, I agree with you, needs to be done now because if we build the wind, we, if the wind farms are built and then after the fact, you say, oh, by the way, let's provide the data. A, it will be more costly, but probably more importantly will be, well, why, you know, it, or, you know, it, they'll just, it won't get there, but it should be a condition of those investments. Um, and then you're right, everyone can benefit, even the wind industry, turbine performance, subject to competitive antitrust concerns, uh, placement, maintenance, operations, the whole, I agree with you completely. Um, on that topic, Voodoo, great conversation, Frank, too, a great presentation. Um, on the data set situation, though, you mentioned the divide between uh, wholesale markets and regulated markets. I'm in a regulated market state, as is Budu Bidori. Um, and there we do have very difficult uh, time getting data. But when you have wholesale markets, you can get, you can get those bids into the marketplace. My uh, colleagues in um, the electricity research area around uh, the um, – topics we've been discussing are awash with data from the open markets and we in the south have none <laughs> so um yeah that seems unfair one of anyway. the yeah that's has been one of the advantages and one of the motivations for wholesale electricity uh, markets was the transparency and the rtos and isos have done a, a lot of Good job. Now, some of it is protected for, you know, bidding, you know, either by time or it's camouflaged to some extent. But there are also lots of other areas of data that would be beneficial. For example, yes, like the one I just talked about, which is a wind turbine in the middle, not in the middle, in the ocean, collecting weather data that could be then linked to just the Coast Guard all the way through the NCAR doing the long term and everyone else. I think we need to move on. So thank you very much, Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then if you, um, if you have additional questions or as questions occur to you, um, keep them in mind because we'll, have, we'll bring him back up uh, later. Our next speaker is Yume Wong, who's come to us from Portland, Oregon, where she is a geotechnical engineer with the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Her work focuses on building resilience to natural hazards. And one of the greatest threats on the Pacific coast, especially in the northwestern part of the um, 48 US states, is a tsunami producing earthquake along that 700 mile Cascadia subduction zone that parallels the coast. So a major thrust of her work has involved being able to identify the vulnerabilities and to increase Oregon's resilience to tsunami, as well as to other forms of coastal inundation. Yume Wong has served as an advisor to the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. She took part in a FEMA-funded project to develop tsunami methodology, and she was involved in the 2013 Oregon Resilience Plan. She has participated in post-earthquake damage assessments in Japan and Chile, and you may have seen her on TV. <laughs> She's been a guest on PBS NewsHour and has appeared in documentaries produced by NOVA, National Geographic, and Discovery. Earlier in her career, she served as a congressional fellow in the Senate, and she currently serves on the National Academy's Liquefaction excuse me, Committee. The title of her presentation is Oregon's Energy Sector Vulnerabilities. So, you may want. Thank you, Carol. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'll be talking about uh, Oregon's Energy Sector Vulnerabilities and be providing a perspective. As an engineer, I work for a small uh, scientific agency for the state of Oregon, so it's state government. And I'll touch upon hazards, impacts, ripple effects, uh, some of the current actions that we're taking, as well as some of our resilience needs. So our small agency, the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, 
Uh, part of our mission is to better understand natural hazards and to make sure that the best scientific information gets out to the public, um, including the impacts from the natural hazards and to help with public safety. So uh, we work with all of the seasonal um, natural hazards. We're just uh, approaching winter. So we are dealing with storms and flooding and landslides and uh, coastal erosion. Um, all the time of the year, we worry, worry about non-seasonal uh, natural hazards. So earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, volcanoes. And Oregon's biggest natural hazard is from the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake uh, that Carol mentioned. Um, this would hit the coastal area extremely hard. So all of the West Coast is on the Pacific Ring of Fire. Uh, the earthquake last week in Alaska, the magnitude 7, was on the Ring of Fire. You have the infamous San Andreas Fault in California. And at the northern end of the San Andreas Fault, you have the Cascadia subduction zone. So the red zone uh, up on the left side is the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, if you look at the right side, the image shows a 700 mile long fault that extends from Northern California along Oregon, Washington, and then ends in British Columbia. And this fault uh, is triggered every few hundred years. Um, it can produce magnitude nine earthquakes and it has produced about 40 uh, past large uh, magnitude eight or nine earthquakes. And when the earth shakes, it's going to shake for on the order of five minutes. So a very long time. Um, there will be co-seismic subsidence along the coast. So Oregon would have about three to five feet of coastal subsidence that will cause flooding. Um, also about 15 minutes after the earthquake starts, there will be uh, tsunami flooding that hits the coast. So this is, uh, uh, will be a big deal. So with that as background, I'd like to address the three questions that Carol mentioned in her introduction of this. And I'd like to, if I may, take them out of order. I'm going to start with number two. What impacts are likely to affect large geographical areas and persist for substantial periods of time? So rewind back to 2011, the Japan Tohoku earthquake occurred and uh, our our legislature, uh, we, we briefed our governor in our legislature about the damage. So there was damage to the energy industry with Fukushima. Um, there were explosions and fires and spills of uh, liquid fuel and problems with natural gas. Um, and so our legislature wanted to know what would happen with a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. There are a lot of parallels. So they passed unanimously a uh, House resolution that called for an Oregon Resilience Plan. And in 2013, uh, the earthquakes, the State Earthquake Commission issued this plan. You see it on the left-hand side. And that plan addresses critical services, how long the expected downtime would be, and divided it to different zones in Oregon. And along the coast, it's expected to have a very long downtime for critical services on the order of months and even years in some cases. And in the valley, about 60 miles inland, where you have the economic center, including Portland, um, you would also, we would also expect to have a long downtime on the order of months. The recovery would be quicker, but still something very significant. So looking at electricity, for example, which is the best performing um, sector, uh, industry experts, this was the consensus uh, number here, estimate that there would be on the order of three to six months of downtime before the grid could get back up to about normal conditions. And in the valley, it would be about one to three months. So this is what uh, expert would con consider a black sky event where you have a prolonged outage for a large geographical area. And these uh, images simply show the uh, extent of the damage that is expected. On the left side is the transportation system with the major highways being out. There would literally be uh, you know, lots of damage to the bridges and landslides on the roads. On the right side is the expected outage for communication systems. 
Now looking at the coast, most um, or all of Oregon's coast is really pretty rural. Uh, this is the town of Seaside. Um, I'm sorry, it's the beautiful town of Newport. Um, you can see that we have a nice commercial fishing fleet there uh, showing on the left-hand side. There's also um, a lot of marine uh, science research being done. I'm happy to say that Oregon State University is in the process of building the state's first uh, tsunami resistant structure building. It's it so rather than needing to uh, move out of the tsunami zone to protect yourself, people can simply move up the building and protect themselves. You also see the big LNG tank. It's um, you know just for peak power, and um, you know the entire community relies on uh, energy. Um, this LNG tank is in the tsunami zone, but it's also in the FEMA flood zone. If you look at the map on the lower right, it's in the 100-year flood zone. Okay, I'd like to switch gears to talk about um, liquid fuel. Back in 2010, I led a study with the Oregon Department of Energy and the Oregon uh, Public Utility Commission and looked at Oregon's energy sector, so liquid fuel, natural gas, and uh, electricity, and we looked at all of the natural hazards, and we pinpointed the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake as being the biggest hazard. And um, it, and on the left side is the report cover. Uh, this is just about a mile downstream from downtown Portland, and the major energy facilities are circled in yellow uh, dash lines. On the right side are just the, what some of those facilities look like. We have oil tanks right up against the river, um, as well as uh, transmission and distribution substations. Um, looking at our liquid fuel supply chain, Oregon gets uh, almost 100% of its oil from coastal refineries up in Washington state. And that oil product is either piped down uh, in a pipeline built in the 1960s, there's a lot of river crossings um, that that pipeline goes through. We're concerned about those as being weak points during a Cascadia earthquake. And about 25% of the oil is, trans uh, is, is transferred via ship. And the ship needs to come in through the Columbia River mouth and up to Portland. So we would certainly expect to have a lot of tsunami damage at the Columbia River mouth in addition to problems with the shipping channel itself. And then from there, they're stored temporarily in fuel terminals um, in Portland for statewide distribution. And looking at the fuel terminals, uh, this is what they look like. Um, many of these facilities have, uh, they were built you know, up over time uh, for, for, for the past decades. In fact, we even have some tanks that are over 100 years old, still in use. Um, if you look at the piers, these old wooden piers, they are are being used by really large ships that were that they were not designed to uh, to, to to function there. Um, if you take a look at the right hand um, image, you can see that pier is what our state of Oregon depends on. That skinny little old rusty bracket. So, um, it, you know, this this is a problem. Um, we, we, uh, it, and all the ground there is on uh, dredge fill, which is highly liquefiable. So we would expect to have a prolonged fuel shortage, not just for emergency response, but also for recovery. Um, the likelihood of spills is high, as well as fires. Um, we have a very limited uh, response capacity, and um, you know, we, we all need fuel. Uh, fuel during normal times and especially during disaster times fuel for, for instance, emergency generators for hospitals, for water treatment plants, uh, fuel for uh, inspection trucks to see what is going wrong with the electrical grid and as well as for equipment to actually restore the grid. So looking at question number two, what are the potential ripple effects do we uh, need to understand them better. Absolutely, we need to understand them a lot better. Um, just to take uh, an example of if 
if and when the electricity goes out. To restore electricity, starting on the upper left, you need to have your roads reopen. For, for, to restore roads, you need to have your fuel supplies. To restore uh, your fuel supplies, you need to have electricity. And you also need to have electricity for water. You get the picture. So taking a look at lifelines at a glance, um, unlike Frank who put electricity in the center of the universe, I'm putting communities in the center of the universe. And all communities um, rely on you know, these critical services. Uh, fuel is up there, electricity is up there. Um, and in you know, normal times, there is very reliable delivery of these services. It's actually an amazing network of systems that work uh, it worked pretty well, really pretty well in harmony. Um, and, it, and all these systems were actually built independently. Um, during a disaster, all this can com completely fall apart. Um, I've been on a number of uh, post-earthquake uh, engineering investigation teams to see what would happen, um, how lifeline systems have performed um, from an earthquake. And I can tell you that it's so common to have fuel shortages, to have electrical blackouts or brownouts. And without these um, systems, when one system goes down and fails another system or they, uh, multiple systems are harmed, you can really break things apart and the community, uh, the community suffers. So luckily there are things that can be done. Um, there are options for emergency response conditions. For fuel, for instance, you can store on-site fuel at hospitals uh, for their generators. You can have generators for electricity. Um, but no matter, the, but, but the level of service from, um, from the community, from the emergency response um, uh, method is never at the level of service that you need for things to run as normal. So just taking a look at before, during, and after disasters, our lifelines, um, we end with uh, the emergency response conditions that are not providing enough services for every day. So it's really a question of how fast you can restore your services to the normal level that you need will dictate how resilient your community is. You absolutely need uh, energy, things from uh, you know, the, you know, liquid fuel, natural gas, and, and uh, electricity. And if you don't, then it's going to prolong your recovery and it's going to uh, really cause a lot of setbacks. Okay, I'd like to switch gears to hospitals. Um, when a hospital goes down, um, in, in any time, but especially during a disaster, it can really have very big ripple effects. In fact, uh, snowball effects where the impacts are accelerated and they're, uh, they grow exponentially. So this is a picture of Tillamook Hospital from the roof. You can see that there's flooding. Tillamook is where you get that delicious cheese. I hope that you tried. Um, this is a hospital that floods. Uh, every few years, and their parking lot is flooded, their helipad is flooded, the water's lapping up against the hospital, it's seeping into their um, their their hospital, and um, they uh, they're also in the tsunami zone. So we're working with them on how to reduce uh, their their flooding hazards. You might ask, well, why don't they just build a flood wall since they flood all the time? And it's difficult. They are under-resourced. Uh, they have tried to build a flood wall. There are uh, governmental barriers to building flood structures in flood plains, especially where there's salmon. Uh, we're actually working with all 11 coastal hospitals in the state of Oregon. Uh, the marks with the blue H's is where the hospitals are located on the map on the left and the red dots are all the um, highly seismically vulnerable bridges. So we expect the red dots to, to have um, bridge damage and therefore the, in a Cascadia earthquake and therefore the hospitals will be isolated. On the right side is a hospital that was just built last year. It has 
um, very robust seismic engineering and design to it, but it's in the tsunami zone and it gets its power from um, a distribution and uh, transmission substation just about a block away, also in the tsunami zone. So we were with the CEO a couple months ago. They don't have a viable tsunami evacuation route. The building was not designed to withstand tsunami. So they have a lot of hard decisions uh, ahead of them to improve their tsunami safety. Um, so one of the things that they might be able to do if they're hit by a tsunami is to plan how to provide medical services outside of the tsunami flooding zone. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with all of the hospitals is working with them so that they have reliable power uh, when the grid goes down. So we broke things up into three stages where the first stage is to have uh, emergency uh, fuel at the site. Um, they're required to have 96 hours, but we're saying they need to actually be able to be self-sufficient for three weeks before the state can get there to help them out. So when they run out of fuel on site, then they're going to need to get it locally. And there's really limited fuel available locally because of the way that the just-in-time supply chain works. And then after about three weeks, the state will be able to provide fuel to the county. The county will get it to the hospital. So this has been a work in progress since we uh, issued our report uh, back in 2013. Okay, so um, the last question, what additional scientific knowledge is needed to support efforts to reduce flood damage to coastal energy infrastructure? Um, we, we need a lot of good information. Without good scientific information, then you can't do good planning and you can't make good investments. So some of the things that are needed is just a better understanding of post-Cascadia earthquake flood conditions. Um, also, how changes in the storm patterns uh, and magnitudes, uh, uh, you know, what we expect. And it's not just, you know, storm surges. It's storm surges combined with high tides and with riverine flood conditions. This is what hits uh, the Tillamook Hospital every few years. They're at the confluence of um, the tidal uh, influence as well as with five rivers that flood there. Um, I also think that we absolutely need to bring the energy sector players um, on board. We do need public-private partnerships, as was just talked about. Without the input from the energy sector players, we aren't going to be able to define the problems well enough and come out with viable solutions. And I think one way to help bring uh, the energy sector to the table is by having good scenarios, so flood disaster scenarios of energy facilities um, that helps to in you know pretty pretty clear terms that helps to define what the problems are and will help tease out some of the solutions and we need our coastal engineers to help with coastal flood mitigation options there's a lot of them out there i don't know what they all are but you know for example relocation where i think marilyn called it retreat um, is a possible solution seawalls whether they are traditional seawalls or uh, or, or uh, kind of nature-based um, bioengineered seawalls or flood barriers. You know, these all need to be on the table with information about the cost effectiveness, about the benefit, you know, having benefit cost analyses. So um, in order to reduce the impacts of flood disasters in the energy sector, we need to be uh, proactive. And this means also thinking in terms of not just from the technical side, but from uh, the social science side and from uh, the government, uh, governmental uh, side as well as um, Frank, Frank was mentioning. You know, this we need to look at how to uh, address the barriers. We need to learn about the barriers, how to address them, and also how to provide incentives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phew. I'm, I'm thinking of three to six months of, what did you call it? Black sky? Yeah. It's stunning. Bad days. Yeah, it's just stunning to see. You know, we think, we think about a, we, we see these images of a, a wave washing over the shore or a, a flood surge that lasts a few hours and just to think about the consequences lasting for, um, hours, days, months, 
um, and your chart was like 36 months in many cases. That was um, the kind of take a deep breath information, and it's true. I think we need we need more such models and estimates so we can visualize this these effects better. Uh, we have we do have a few minutes for questions. Do we have questions for you, Mei Wang? And can we have a microphone, Remy? If if you would please identify yourself briefly before you ask, that would be great. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Zamuda from the Department of Energy. Um, all the presentations have been great. Um, a question for you. Um, it, it was striking in your presentation today um, the acknowledgement of what people know before they're making decisions. Uh, and it's one thing in terms of how to kind of retrofit uh, existing infrastructure, but you gave some excellent examples here of where new assets were put in place uh, in a high risk zone. Uh, and I guess the question that that kind of stimulates is, all the speakers have talked about the need for additional data. Uh, and I guess the question I'd have is, is that really going to be helpful? Uh, clearly, the decision makers knew exactly where they were putting that and the risk associated with that. So do we really need additional data to provide that insight? Or is the decision making process not structured really around the risk, but there's other factors that are driving that to which you didn't necessarily allude to today, but they're kind of behind the scenes and playing a critical role. So you, you end with a comment about being proactive. What's happening that we're still kind of repeating the mistakes of yesterday with regards to potential exposure to future risk? Yeah, thank you, Craig, for that question. Um, with the, the hospital in Gold Beach, uh, there are various degrees of the hazard, and they are on kind of the outer uh, fringe of the tsunami hazard. So if the earthquake produces a small tsunami, then they will be fine. If the earthquake produces a big tsunami, then they could be actually 60 feet underwater. So they, when they were building the, um, the, the hospital, they were required to build a new hospital because they weren't meeting some state regulations not involving tsunami and, and earthquake issues. Um, and when they were considering building the new hospital, there were a lot of pressures on them. And they were aware of the tsunami hazards. Um, unfortunately, that town, in addition to three other towns with, with hospitals in the tsunami zone, are mostly low lying, and there are a lot of tsunami hazards in these uh, in these towns. So I think it's important to look at the type of actions that can be taken to reduce their risk. Tsunamis obviously don't happen every day. We're talking about uh, the options of building protective uh, wall structures um, for for that hospital. Um, and also what they can do to evacuate who they can. Um, they may need to evacuate up or evacuate out. They don't have a viable evacuation route out. Um, and they also might need to be able to just provide medical services in a different location that is safer. Um, there are some tsunami uh, restrictions right now in Oregon. If you're really close to the water, you cannot build uh, certain types of structures like hospitals there, but this was outside of that area. I think that, you know, what is really needed is, um, in a lot of areas, is, is better, uh, is some better regulation. We build all over the place in the flood zone, which is also liquefiable in, in earthquakes. We simply can't not build there. We just need to think about what are some you know, what are some ways that we can build, and this can't be done in a vacuum, it has to be with, uh, you know, private partner, private public partnership and a viable solution. Um, as far as new energy facilities uh, that are being constructed, we have wind farms, solar farms, you know, going up all over the place in Oregon. Uh, we do have new requirements of as, as of last year that the uh, proposed uh, developer consider disaster resilience 
in their design as well as future climate in their design. These are really soft regulations, but they're uh, the first ones that we have in there. And uh, we absolutely need better scientific information so that they uh, can design according to them. I was happy to hear about um, in New Jersey that uh, there would be instrumentation requirements for offshore wind farms so that there could be better uh, information for, for future building. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, this is a question for both you and for Marilyn. Um, I'm hearing that the retreat option is often uh, more economically viable and perhaps more sustainable over the long term. But, you know, if we're still building f new facilities in floodplains and uh, tsunami zones, what's the prospect that we're you know, realistically going to retreat from the coast? And for residential land use where people want the amenities of being close to the coastline and all that affords them further mental health and, and other health benefits that have been associated with that for physical activity. Is it realistic to try to pursue retreat policies? Is that something that is going to ever really happen in the United States or in other places? I could offer some remarks on that and then I'd be able to put my name tent down too because this is what I was going to make as a comment to Craig as well. Um, I think that we've got to get our insurance rates made more fair. That would help a lot if you actually, if you stop, if we stop subsidizing these high risk new builds, if they can't get insurance unless it's at the rate of say total replacement value on an annual basis or something, you know, whatever is fair and not uh, not provide the subsidized rates that we are now. There's a movement along this line. So there's some debate, there's been some debate in Congress already at trying to regulate the insurance industry to uh, make it more um, responsive to the real threats that we're facing today. What do you think? Might that help? Well, I would now say Power. I'm sorry, the, the great urgency of, of kind of building back as quickly as you can to restore that power versus doing it in a more preventative, proactive, and much more cost-effective manner. So whether it's insurance, whether it's federal programs that are also providing subsidies, uh, we, we do need to do something to, to incentivize people to take action today rather than waiting later where we're going to end up paying even more. So let me just add that I think it's important that when we think about new building that things are closely, that, that they're carefully prioritized. Um, when we have critical infrastructure that our communities and society at large depend on, then we need to take a harder look and perhaps have higher safety standards. Ports obviously have to be at the waterfront. Um, we have an entire coastal town called Seaside. It's called Seaside because it's built right on the side of the sea. Um, one of the really remarkable and encouraging things that has happened uh, with Seaside is they used to have every single one of their schools in the tsunami zone. And even one of their schools got hit by the distant tsunami from the 1964 Alaska earthquake. It was uh, in a very low lying place. Um, as of 2020, all of the schools will be uh, out of the tsunami zone. They, after you know, a lot of effort and failed efforts in, in included, 
Um, they finally passed a bond and there will be a new school uh, campus that is built up in the hills. And perhaps with that as a start, it will help the community build other infrastructure up there, uh, fire stations, um, you know, emergency service buildings, as well as other, um, you know, government buildings that don't really need to be right down by the ocean. Thank you. Okay, um, Bill, you had a question. Yeah, just a quick uh, question. I was always interested in the context of climate change, uh, the role of extreme events is sort of motivating sort of action. And you started the conversation with the uh, Fukushima, the Japan earthquake, sort of motivating activities in Port in Portland and, and the Oregon coast specifically. So I, I, my question is, that, you know, um, how do you think that experience has sort of translated over time? I mean, what were the factors that sort of allowed it to sort of manifest in the context of Oregon? And has it sort of, you know, uh, we, we, we also heard earlier this morning about the legacy of Katrina and some other disasters in the Gulf Coast sort of motiv motivating change. So I'm wondering how, how you see that experience playing out and has it gone as far as you think it could have and what have been some of those shifts over time now, I guess, seven years plus on? Yeah, I think that um, there are uh, a number of wake up calls that have really helped uh, Oregon take big leaps in advancements in preparing for Cascadia earthquakes. When I started to work on uh, Cascadia earthquakes, the Cascadia subduction zone, people thought I was saying the Cascadia seduction zone. It's like, no, you know, it's actually just the Cascadia fault. Um, now, uh, and with Fukushima, I mean, with uh, Tohoku, for example, um, really there is wide, uh, wide scale awareness of the earthquake uh, risk in the Pacific Northwest and some very important systemic changes in the government have occurred because of that earthquake. Uh, first, we have the Oregon Resilience Plan and that the recommendations were delivered to the legislature and there were hundreds of recommendations and that the, the legislature said, wow, you know, but we can't take action on this, this is too much. So there was yet another task force, but that task force pared things down to just 10 key recommendations. And the key recommendation from that task force, in addition to the earlier work, was to have a state resilience officer in the governor's office. And that person needs to work on this problem, which is a multi-generational problem. It's far beyond what a typical you know, what any election cycle uh, is, whether it's, you know, four years for governor or uh, six years for a U.S. senator. Um, you know, we're talking about a 50-year plan that we need to make sure um, transcends any kind of political pressures. So we have an Oregon resilience officer uh, that has been put in place in 2016. It required Senate confirmation, and we are making rapid and important gains because of that. Okay, we'll take just one more, and then we'll take a break. So after after Buddha's question, um, we'll hold questions for the discussion later. So, um, so Buddha Badri, I'm one of the committee members. Um, I was fascinated by your presentation, but I have one question. In my experience, when you, when the community stakeholders, including um, state entities like you, ask for data or um, knowledge or information from the scientific community, um, we researchers um, produce that at a certain level of fidelity where our confidence is the highest. And in my experience, that is not always aligned with the resolution or the fidelity of the information that the agencies need to actually make an investment decisions. So do you have very specific um, examples of um, a, you know, the state of Oregon or your department uh, investment question that is awaiting data from the community or information from the community? Like you are about to, you are going to make an infrastructure decision 
whether it's energy infrastructure, other infrastructure from your department, but you just can't do it because there is not enough data. Um, thanks for that question. I can't think of anything offhand, but what I would like to say is that it's important that the information, the scientific information that uh, we receive is understandable and hopefully actionable. For example, climate scientists have a lot of, uh, you know, models, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's, um, you know, a lot of scientific debate as is good. Um, but we took a different route with the Cascadia earthquake so that we could make sure that it was nonpartisan and we could make steps, you know, it, make steps, make sure we made advancements and not have an argument about is it going to be a magnitude eight or is it going to be a magnitude nine? Is it going to pay, you know, shake this hard for this long or is it going to, you know, be, be a different level of shaking? In the year 2000, we had a prestigious Penrose conference that's supported by the Geological Society of America. And we had worldwide experts on Cascadia come together and have a scientific consensus that the Cascadia Fault has triggered magnitude nine earthquakes and it will in the future. And that gave us really one number to move ahead with with a lot of scientific authority and that was extremely helpful and I think in general um, that helps. Uh, I have been yelled at by politicians when I when we talk in terms of uncertainty or probabilities. Uh, if they don't understand that, you know, you, you can't make any politician look look dumb and make uh, friends with them and, and make any and, you know, have any partnerships and make any gains. So it needs to be um, the, the information needs to be understandable. And if you want to have action taken, then it needs to be actionable. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Tom Allen. Tom is professor of geography in the Department of Political Science and Geography at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, which if you've looked at the sea level rise maps of the East Coast, you might already appreciate that Norfolk is a hot spot of sea level rise. Um, his work addresses coastal environmental problems and hazards using geographic information systems, remote sensing, cartography, and spatial analysis. He is currently a senior fellow with the Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resiliency, and he recently chaired the board of the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership. In the American Association of Geographers, he has chaired the Coastal and Marine Specialty Group and served as a director of the Remote Sensing Specialty Group. His PhD, which is in geography, is from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he also has the little feather in his cap of having been a Fulbright faculty scholar in Finland. The title of his presentation is Sea Level and Storm Surge Exposure of Coastal Energy Assets, Insights from Port and Water Infrastructure Assessments from Norfolk to Charleston. Tom, podium's yours. I think Remy will cue me up. Thank you. It's an honor and uh, pleasure. Yeah, I, one of the things I'm going to come to maybe posit is that looking at places like Norfolk and Charleston and maybe others that you've heard today uh, provide a little lens to the future. We are living the experience. In Norfolk, uh, every day I get up and I look down down one side of the street and I see, am I going to go in that way or not? Because the tidal flooding has uh, become a phenomena. But it took an extreme events to wake this wake the area up. In particular, uh, the 2008-2009 uh, Norida hurricane. I had been on the faculty at Old Dominion for about 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I wanted to move even further. Uh, south on the coast. I, I was at East Carolina for 10 years and uh, I recently re re returned about two years ago and the area is alive and awake and in attuned uh, to these hazards uh, in a way that it was never before. So uh, reflecting on that, I'm going to have uh, an overview and a case study that really looks at Norfolk and a project with the Port of Virginia and then we'll turn and talk about uh, a project 
in Charleston, both have, have, have been published. And so they give a little bit of a, a lens for examples. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm the first person from Old Dominion to also uh, put a new logo up there. The one on the second from the right, ICAR. So I'll, I'll hoist the flag. It's the Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, which tries to bring faculty from across campuses. So check. Um, a lot of uh, echoes, maybe just quick underscores from things you've already heard. So I'll, I will pop around, but I, ke I, keep, uh, I like to kick things off with some realizations that a lot of the infrastructure that we are using and, and taking for granted on a day-to-day -day basis was designed for a different climate. And particularly in Norfolk, it's uh, a different storm regime, a different sea level, a different water table, a different atmosphere. So these, this comes to point us out that we really need to think about climate change in a more holistic way that may affect the grid. Perhaps we, we need to look at future demand. If we retreat inland, there's gonna be a displacement in demand, an increase with the extreme heat waves. There are hu human health dimensions of that uh, that are also really important. And then a the, uh, sort of scale issue. So my second bullet here, uh, there are several uh, popular tools and toolkits and web maps out there that if you overlay any type of infrastructure, you'll see some implicit vulnerabilities. But it may require uh, looking at a finer scale, a larger scale in geography terms to assessing the actual susceptibility to determining what is an optimal solution to those uh, problems. In some places, I'm an all of the above solution sort of person. It may be we harden here it may make sense to retreat there. And then can we look at the people and the communities involved too? These are gonna be hard things as I, I talked to my um, folks and students and colleagues and neighbors in Norfolk, we're gonna have neighborhoods that are gonna be lost or relocated. And that's a process that we are not familiar with and only beginning to imagine. Uh, I probably don't need to uh, go through this group over these sort of definitions, but in each of these projects that we have done, we have introduced these words and to quite a degree. Uh, the Port of Virginia has an officer for sustainability. What, what does that mean? Does that mean sustainable market customers, operations, supply chains? Or does it mean the Port of Virginia and this terminal is gonna be here for the next 100 years? Does it mean environmental risk management, spills, accidents, and so on? So each project, that we've been undertaking, we've gone through this in a, an educational workshop style up front, just to get this developing uh, a sense of knowledge in common uh, vernacular, and that these things will become uh, operationalized in business processes. So the scale issue, uh, a lot of the work that I had built uh, this experience or talk on has worked with the National Hurricane Center, storm surge modeling, and the need to downscale these things to uh, a more tactical level. So we have this, the sea lakes and overland surges from hurricanes model that's commonly used. It is the operational model. It's been improved. Uh, questions over tr improving the track forecast, the intensity forecast, quantifying the error and the forecast versus reality is, is a complex phenomena itself. And for years, the, the hurricane center was a, somewhat cautious about pushing the button. And that button was downscale, map it at the, ele the flooding at a pixel level with LIDAR, light detection and ranging digital elevation models. That technology is, is here, it's not going away. In fact, it's maybe being supplanted by drones. So um, these things are really here, we have to deal with that. People will push the buttons. Then uh, the other thing is, different sectors have different tolerances for risk, different time horizons. So that's a huge challenge to doing integrated assessments and having people do scenario, emergency management style exercises or planning exercises because people have different timescales. So that's an issue that we confront. Uh, the graphic here on the, on the right are showing um, the slosh basins uh, that the Hurricane Center runs. And then we have actual Amb ambiguities in the model that uh, depend a lot on where the surge will be based on the track. And so those are things you don't have the luxury or they don't take the luxury. So they, they take the worst case scenario. 
maximum by maximum inundation. However, at the bottom uh, in this image, we have run a Monte Carlo simulation on the digital elevation model. And now we can describe, knowing the accuracy of the elevation data, a probability that if that forecast is correct, what is the actual likelihood of an inundation, a storm surge reaching an area? And it's, uh, it's another set of data that's difficult to communicate. But again, if, if there's uh, an asset uh, or an evacuation route or something else that might have a low probability, high consequence, we can actually, we can do that now. Um, steering you toward the mid-Atlantic a little bit, uh, mentioned Norfolk at the beginning. We're in a sea level rise hotspot in Norfolk. We have uh, extreme subsidence uh, owing to the last glaciation and sort of a four bulge in the tectonics there. It's uh, still subsiding as a result from that. It's not unlike, uh, but a different process from the, the severe subsidence through oil and gas extraction exacerbated in Louisiana, Gulf of Mexico. But uh, there's also other, other factors in the synoptic uh, climate system at play. There's a slowing down of the Gulf Stream there's an Atlantic meridional oscillation that is inducing the Gulf Stream slowing down and backing up against the mid-Atlantic. And a, a lot of the severe flooding that we've had in the recent years is part, partly to that. And many of the projections and climate models anticipate that further um, increasing. So steps to resilience uh, and the, the pitch for case studies here is we have a lot of tools out there uh, in fact, we're very rich in tools, but industries, communities um, are kind of this, have decision points about which tools to use, which are authoritative, and which scenarios do they pick, which sea level rise curve. Now, recently in Virginia, our regional government adopted a sea level rise planning scenario. And it's, it's a willful one. You, you can choose to use it or not. But all of the cities have adopted a, a, a standard and they have agreed to actually participate in updating that. Uh, the state of North Carolina uh, had some issues a number of years ago with uh, sea level rise uh, occurring or not, and they have slowly gravitated back around to a process that they have a five-year update in using sea level projections. Now, the case studies that I'm going to present are the NOAA uh, Climate Program Office-funded Coastal Ocean Communities Adaptation Study, it's in North Carolina and South Carolina. It, we in, integrated the, the Sea Grant uh, NOAA consortium in that, and we worked with the water authorities in two cities. The Moorhead City, which is a port in Southeast North Carolina. You may have heard of Beaufort. It's a small city, about 100,000 people, a small port. It's also an outlet for the Camp Lejeune uh, Marines and many others. Uh, there it's a, there's a military dimension. And Charleston. So obviously a historic and very large port city, but also one of the cities of lowest in terms of elevation datum. Uh, then we'll turn to talk about the Port of Virginia, which we examine one marine terminal. It's extremely large tarmac, but it's situated in the, one of the world's largest ports on the East Coast and one of the busiest harbors in the world next to the world's largest Navy base. And the two models, uh, a couple of the models that we use for this approach is an in integrated assessment. So we, this is a, a paper uh, by Briggs looking at the use of integrated assessment to assess public health. So um, I know you probably can't read that model there, but um, it basically is a process and a workflow that we used, a lot of which involved risk uh, mapping and identification. Now that project brought over about a three year period, uh, stakeholders from multiple sectors. The water uh, sector, which included water supply and wastewater treatment system. We had the hospital and public health sector, emergency management and public safety, and uh, to some degree, the electric supply, the utilities involved. State, local government, private sector as well. There's a, another dimension. This culminated in two workshops, one which was an educational one, and that was a framing workshop where they chose to study a scenario in the 2035 uh, major near landfalling hurricane, not unlike a, a Florence or Michael kind of situation, a hybrid. Uh, we use an actual hurricane track to run a simulation. We, we inventoried 
assets across those sectors, and we created a, a functional exercise for all of them to work through what would be the impacts and how would they assess their resilience. And this is a uh, what's called a story map. That was our portal to actually implementing that in the second phase in a workshop. So there you're seeing um, an air over overlay of storm surges, the max peak storm surge on top of population, water supply systems, wastewater treatment plants, and, and such. And it's not a pretty picture. I don't think it's Cascadia fault zone, but there is a uh, fault zone there in Charleston, uh, if you want to really make it scary. Um, but uh, severe damage. Now, Charleston's being very proactive in protecting their, their water infrastructure as a result. You go to Charleston on any given day, you're probably likely to encounter some tidal flooding. That's another hazard that we considered. But these are pump stations. So they have been hardened. Many of them are underground. But is the electrical power to these, this infrastructure hardened? Is it capable? To some degrees, yes. To some degrees, no. We turned over and we looked at uh, Moorhead City. Um, much less capacity in institutionally, governmentally, uh, in, in terms of capital. Uh, we mapped actually the problem there is uh, there's a substantial backflow problem where tidal water or surges can flow back up the storm sewers and then flood areas into the interior. And a lot of their infrastructure is not hardened. So it's extremely low. And they've had numerous uh, wastewater discharges almost annually uh, a couple of times that has also impacts on the economy uh, resulting in um, beach closures. So the, what each of these uh, municipalities did in our workshop was work through a process that has been used after many fashions um, and other agencies, uh, but a resilience framework. And it's a sort of self-scoring process, but, but uh, facilitated process where they would actually score themselves their ability to respond to each of these hazards and rating themselves and prepare, absorb, recover. One of the novelties of this was we actually brought people from the different sectors together. So they worked on this. And then on the outcome side, they identified how can they work together. You know, uh, most of these groups had never participated together. Uh, that itself, making the contact, was probably some progress. But uh, there's, uh, this was the paper that we published in the Public Works Management and Policy just about two months ago. And uh, you know, one of the key ingredients there was if you have a mass evacuation from a hurricane, um, you know, something like a Michael, Florence, Rita, even Joaquin uh, in the future, uh, a, a, a Maya Express type of atmospheric flooding event, not a landfalling hurricane, could induce the flooding that would be equivalent to a hurricane. Um, I think three weeks ago, Charleston had sixth worst floods. There was no hurricane. There was no tropical storm. It was king tides and onshore flow uh, and a Maya Express rainfall kind of atmospheric river event. But if you don't have electric power, then you don't have a uh, water supply in your hospital, potentially. Maybe you can get Buffalo, um, you know, water tanks and things in there. But if you don't have your level one trauma center open, you don't have reentry. So the longevity of the impacts of a power outage uh, could become quite dire in those kind of situations. I heard echoes of this earlier, talking about uh, Katrina and Rita. I think it was onshore damage resulting in limiting the recovery and resilience. So turning quickly to uh, the Port of Virginia, um, you see in the kind of western side of this image, you see the Norfolk International Terminal North. There are about five of these large terminals to, to the north of that and the far northwest of this image is the Norfolk Naval Base, world's largest naval base. Now, a study has been done for Norfolk Navy Base. $25 million, I think, was the cost of the study. Um, and many, many agencies uh, were involved in that. Um, kind of uh, a blue ribbon, platinum level uh, resilience study. And so far, there's no plan to relocate Norfolk Naval Base. But at some point in time, the military will, is realizing there's a problem here we can have our base open and resilient, but can anyone get to it? So uh, is there power supply coming in? Uh, I'm not yet ready, but I'm thinking about buying a boat. Norfolk International Terminal um, provided a, a good case study because 
ports are an interesting concept. I think there's an analogy analog here to some of the, the soft and the, the private uh, electrical um, you know, grid uh, system. Um, it's a little harder to get data. You have to enter into non-disclosure agreements. There's concerns about competitiveness, port to port, and there's very granular data involved in this inherently. Um, in, the port, in, the, in the right of this image, you have um, electric service being provided to what are called reefers. And these are refrigerated um, containers, bulk containers. Uh, they may be carrying food, it may be medical supplies, uh, who knows, but they need continuous supply. And so the elevation of all of the conduit and all of the um, distribution that feeds them is a, is a critical factor. It, in the background, there are extremely large cranes that run in the tens of millions of dollars each. So this terminal was in the process of developing a new uh, 60 million, maybe excess of that, uh, purchases of new equipment. And they asked the question, are these things going to be okay when sea levels are rising? That was our challenge. So we uh, developed the GIS database and we took implicit uh, a number of uh, concerns. We brought in the best scientific information we had on sea level rise, on subsidence, on future storm intensity. And um, we, we built a GIS for this port terminal, including Z values, elevations, which wasn't readily available. So when you're this low on the, on the elevation, you need to know your elevation. That's a fundamental thing that we're still grappling with. And then we worked with them on what's your risk tolerance? How, what is the time frame that we're looking at? So we bracketed, as, uh, as many people are, when you might start to see the impacts from different processes here. So here we're talking storm surges, and tidal flooding, and even water table elevation levels. So this is um, what was kind of used for plan for that. We used some Army Corps of Engineers tools, and we localized that with the subsidence data that we have. We then looked at different sea level simulation tools and basically inundation models. We turned to most of my expertise is in geospatial modeling. So we then took storm surge models. We run them on new topography and we see what would flood in the future. So we're doing this in-house um, for this particular project. That could be used for other people. It could be used for Sentara Hospital, our level one trauma center, which like Charleston, is located in a floodplain. Um, and there you just see another view of uh, the terminal there to the north. And uh, this is about a, a third of Hampton Roads major port infrastructure. So I'm gonna give you sort of a sense of the extent. And on the right is um, a projection that changes with different sea level rise increments of the extent of each category level, which is a proxy for storm severity. And you'll see as the increment rises to about 80 centimeters, I think we stopped this one, it takes less of a storm to inundate a given area. So that's basically, at some point, your, your high tide today becomes your mean sea level in about 40 years, maybe less. And the image on the left is areas that the port reported as flooding. In fact, we did some site uh, surveys in our data and we found them flooded. It hadn't rained. These are disconnected, at least superficially, to the water. So there is actually some subsurface infiltration going on, backflow that may be filling these areas, tidal inundation. And trucks were driving through, you know, uh, two, three feet of water. That's salt water, by the way. Not a good thing for, for vehicles. So we produce a set of inundation risk maps. We produce a matrix, and then we score, score individual item, infrastructure items. So this might table has in there different types of generators, um, different um, supply substations or even in here, it switches, the reefer boxes and so on. And it provided a, a scaling and a time frame as to when each of these items, which also has other data about it, including its lifespan, its operation, its inspection, and when it might need to be replaced, even if no climate or sea level rise threatens it. So there's optimization that can come out of this in terms of port planning to replace things. Uh, the other sort of side chain, this was more of a discovery, was 
tidal flooding actually is a factor. And it was not something that I think the part actually was really that concerned about. The footprint of our analysis went around the port because a lot of the, the major arterial roads that service the port and the, the railroad itself actually are affected by this. Um, so we actually, we have mapped that ex extensively. And so like we had a storm surge increasing with sea level rise, we have tidal flooding increasing with sea level rise. So that extends into the railroad and potentially the electrical grid infrastructure as well. Uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad is a potential interested party in this too. So we came out of this with some recommendations on sort of the site asset management level. And that's ensure you have everything, you know where things are in terms of their elevation, 3D location. That's gonna be uh, the, a direction that a lot of GIS is going for, coast, for coastal and for risk management. What, whatever technology you need to do to get that, real-time kinematic GPS, drones, laser scanning, mobile mapping, and so forth. Um, the cascading failures, we've already heard about that a bit today, um, but think about the lo location of your personnel in, the, in Norfolk, that's gonna be a big challenge. Um, look at the hydro hydrologic connectivity, not just on the surface, but underground. That's a huge problem. And um, the subsurface there is quite uh, conductive of water and probably therefore electricity. Uh, black flow, tailwater, control of that is also something that's need needing some research. Um, it's gonna be really hard to con contemplate elevating underground pipes. That's a, a concept I'm not wrapping my head around. And the port is actually developing its own GIS to better manage these its infrastructure. It, we started out with uh, you know, dozens of CAD files. So we had to build that, it was a little surprising. And then the resilience questions, which are more uh, planning sort of scale. This uh, is something that I think Campton Roads, Virginia can tout quite a bit as we have a very active adaptation forum of industry and government and academic that we meet almost monthly. And uh, that's a maybe unusual, I think, um, focusing on sea level rise in particular. Monitor the best science that's coming out on sea level rise projections, on storm surges, on nuisance tidal flooding, on their disaster response and emergency management, consider the workforce. The Navy is very large. They, this is the num one of their number one priorities is force protection. So industry may be looking at that more. Engaging with the water community and best practices. Uh, this is where we got into interesting conversations because the ports are watching each other. They are dredging to deeper depths to accommodate the future ever larger ships. When those channels are dredged, they increase the volume of the river such that that actually might cause greater flooding upstream. So there's another concern, displacement of flooding there's a policy issue in our area. If Norfolk decides it wants to build a tide gate, uh, a, a Dutch style storm barrier, and it would close these up, uh, the first thought that comes to mind, well, the surge is still coming in from the Chesapeake Bay. Now, where is it going? It's going into the city of Portsmouth in Chesapeake. So we're not yet there and the, the level of uh, the policy of the Corps of Engineers is restricted to working with one of these municipalities at a time. We don't have a, uh, an agency, a regional government agency in place to work with them. Um, combined hazards, multi cumulative risk. So Hurricane Florence, you know, I call that, or like Harvey, Maybe I would even use the word biblical in, in the South for flooding. Um, it, it wakes you up, 30 inches of rainfall. We did a simulation for uh, Norfolk. What if 30 inches of rainfall fell in Norfolk? And so this graphic, uh, it's, it's a quickly conjured one, it, but it is a model. That's a storm surge flood extent for Norfolk. And the second one I'll, I'll click is the addition of rainfall induced flooding. In, uh, there's some, some Dutch and uh, Danish researchers, they, they call this blue spot mapping, but it's revealing areas of persistent 
sur surface drainage is inadequate. Remember, I, I suggested the climate's changed. Well, guess what? There's new studies show that it's the, the extreme rainfall is actually about 20% more than most of the stormwater drains in this region were designed for. And uh, that's, that's been recently um, documented. So uh, on the lack of time, um, we just participated in a study, uh, NASA Disasters Program. I think there is a group here at headquarters in charge of this, but also NASA Langley. In our area, we had a multi-institutional group do a, a rapid study last year to prototype some of these things. So working with Virginia Institute of Marine Science, uh, the Water Center, USGS, University of Alabama, and a few others, um, I think Virginia Tech, we did a study in Hampton Roads, Eastern North Carolina, and a little bit further up the bay to study what new, what gaps are there in some of these technologies for mapping the risk, mapping the flooding threat. The one I didn't show, and it's in this uh, story map, is uh, infraferometric SAR. You mentioned the, my remote sensing background. So yes, I did push the pixels. It's uh, a method for mapping uh, surface topography or subsidence or accretion. And so that's a rapid uh, new innovation that's being used increasingly. Uh, and new satellites coming out will support that. But also visualization. Actually, uh, Esri participated and some of the, the assistance on some of these examples. And um, is a 3D model uh, reanalysis we did of Hurricane Irene on, with addition of sea level rise. This is, happens to be North Carolina site. So we've actually flooded buildings. And for each of those buildings, the state of North Carolina has done a model example. They've mapped every building over a thousand square feet, including its first floor elevation. So they're able to project uh, damages to quite an advanced level. If you're familiar with the uh, HAZUS uh, damage loss estimation tool, uh, they've actually got really excellent data to support that type of analysis, at least today. So finally, closing out where we think we're, you know, some recommendations maybe from these two studies is we produced a guidebook for water infrastructure and public health kind of co-management, uh, co-planning. And that was part of this paper that we had published. It springs off of an EPA study that is kind of a, a, a toolkit for just strictly water utilities. But it, this ours brings that into public health connection. Uh, for energy, I'm gonna roll through these because we've largely uh, covered them. Uh, echoing the unique integral uh, value of electricity. <laughs> but also there's a review paper that I discovered in, in quickly prepping for this that reviewed a seven, 47 articles of sea level rise and critical infrastructure generally. And it pointed also quite uh, closely to um, energy and some of its limitations. Uh, there's another paper that's uh, an interesting read on how there are coastal hotspots and how maybe regional scale is gonna be an important scale to analyze these hotspots for integrated assessments. It would be difficult to do that with, without data for research. And uh, the process that I went through with one, one city in Charleston, Morehead City, it's uh, impossible to do that unless we have data. Um, and I think this has been echoed, but uh, the Gulf uh, kind of energy coast uh, just says what I said in a peer reviewed way, more precise methods, models, to accommodate, uh, understand infrastructure risk. I'll skip that, but that's the impact of individual extreme events. The, 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 the slowdown of recovery from Katrina and Rita largely pointed to damage that was inland that slowed the recovery of the, 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 that fossil fuel energy production at least. And then real quickly, the adaptation measures we can talk about. Um, I, I struggled with this myself. It, what about retreat, which we were last talking about before the break. Retreat is inevitable from where I stand because we can't protect everything. Um, and so we don't quite have the tools and people can't really imagine uh, besides some, some maps and animations, their neighborhoods being underwater continuously. Um, however, we are working on the renewables. And in a way, renewable is a type of retreat. We're not replacing things and we're not just moving them, the, you know, 
the coal plants, the gas plants, we're actually turning to something that's resilient. So Dominion Energy has got a $300 million pilot study and actual offshore energy going in uh, off uh, Virginia Beach. Um, another controversial maybe, uh, maybe it's all of the above is true, undergrounding utilities. Uh, I, I saw ranges of, in my review of, you know, put Houston electrical distribution underground, one study, $80 billion. Um, you know, maybe that makes sense in some places, in some neighborhoods or some particular utilities. Uh, it's not happening very much on transmission, apparently, but uh, this is an option. It's just extremely expensive. So you have to think about what is the resilience result of solving a recovery problem or an outage uh, res responsivity kind of problem. In Florida, the bedrock was mentioned. In my area, it's salinization of the, of the, of the water. Uh, saltier water will corrode just about anything you put underground. So we are at the point where some of our water utilities are going to maybe be rep replacing things higher and uh, more costly. Uh, new safety hazards with putting transformers underground and more difficulty replacing them and cost is certain a certainty. And I, I read about the North, the uh, New York City uh, blizzard of 1888 how everything before then was above ground electric distribution. And uh, the blizzard knocked that out and drove it underground uh, largely. So I think there's some lesson to be learned in that. And I would conclude uh, infrastructures approaching obsolescence should be receiving a lot of attention. And when we need to map and quantify the susceptibility of them at the appropriate scale, uh, the, the risk tolerance of different, these different sectors is difficult for them to come together and assess in an integrated way, but we can discuss that. And, um, and I think there's a value to comparative research. Uh, Frank was mentioning how we could look at different regions because they are inherently by policy or history giving us case studies. Um, I'm in Norfolk. We're not as low as Charleston, so I'm looking at Charleston. Um, in one sense, it's maybe a little morbid. Um, and then in, in Hampton Roads and also Charleston too, there are these nascent communities of practice developing. There's a social science question in there, a policy question in there. Um, we have brought folks from the Netherlands routinely to the United States. Norfolk and Charleston planners and elected officials are in discussions, traveling to each other's places. So you, we are seeing these things start to bubble up and actually resilience kind of going mainstream, I think. Um, and I'm left with this kind of, I started with a quote, I'll end with one. Uh, this is a geographer from uh, Santa Barbara and it's uncertainty is, uh, it's a challenge. It's, but I think geographic sciences and engineering actually have some of the best science to provide to solving these problems and, and quantifying these uncertainties or these risk tolerances. So um, that's where I'm interested in some, some of our research. Thank you for the opportunity. Do we have a, a burning question for Tom Allen or even a not so burning question? And I think, Budu, go ahead. So this is really fantastic work. Um, the one thing that I keep thinking about is, um, is there a common framework or model or scale of building resiliency towards um, in coastal communities? So if I am a coastal community and I am looking at your presentation, you know, at some point I have to make the decision about investing my resources. And I'm going to go into this um, exercise of getting the maximum ROI to bring my resiliency up to the, the best possible level, right? So how do we also capture some of that instead of just 
um, focusing or, or there must be a message emerging from as you are looking at different communities mm. to create a common model so a city can say I need to collect these kinds of data so I can understand mm. what is my resiliency today and if I have X million dollars or X billion dollars um, I can bring it up to a resiliency of X plus Delta whatever that is mm. um, so it, it helps us to sort of propagate that benefits out um, well I think my two first impulses to answer that are one is the scale of uh, action and the scale of impact uh, we, we can recognize uh, some communities a lot of the models and the, the GIS data are at a scale that they have not really had uh, you know even though uh, we made a map there of hurricane of what if hurricane Florence uh, I, I made a map in Hampton Roads of Hurricane Matthew of flooding because no one actually could tell me what flooded and we just had a uh, press coverage we had events but uh, the models were actually the best estimate of what actually flooded then we started getting damage reports and so the unit one the other answer to this is the unit of impact is the property owner uh, to, on that level right now that's probably what we're hearing the most and then um, that gets becomes a, a policy political question very quickly because of the cost uh, the value that, that you know cities survive off of in off of property taxes and they provide the services but uh, that is an intrinsic fundamental policy a problem so right now we are solving the problems where we're protecting the most value and that may not be an equitable solution uh, in some sense of it um, Virginia Beach had some major flooding in one area um, it was pretty distant actually from the water and it was heavy rainfall flooding and um, you know, now they're they're trying to trying to be a little more equitable about that but we have a lot of de facto policies already in place their historic inertia of them that uh, we su we support uh, beach nourishment we have a lot of uh, FEMA repair and replace kind of policies in, in, in there we have the insurance question that came up so I don't think there's a single scale if you ask me one to ten thousand or 20 meter pixels but we can map the flooding down to meters we can predict the sea level rise to centimeters to a degree but we haven't been able to integrate uh, a resilience planning at a particular scale question from back here and, and maybe maybe you can find a microphone and tell us who you are hi I'm Jessica Mormon from DOE Office of Science and you had mentioned um, as one of your recommendations to uh, stakeholders is to access and monitor the best possible science um, this is actually something that we were discussing during the break that different communities and different sectors access information in different places and may not find it so I was just I don't assume that you can address that whole problem I was curious what your recommendation was um, specifically of where they could monitor and access that science and what is it in a form that is readily digestible and usable for them to pull out that information to you yeah for sea level rise that that's a fairly recent uh, evolution uh, NOAA has some sea level rise trends that they have they publish so those are really excellent. I had a little slide with a, pic a picture, uh, low res of one of those that shows a tool that they use. And then in terms of projections, uh, they, they are publishing those, but you have a family of curves out there and you have really the ski jump curves, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, but we have, we have suggested that they look at each of those. The, the NOAA, which has, you know, low intermediate high, and we've been using the intermediate high for the short to medium time frame of 30, 40 years. Uh, and the Corps of Engineers is another one. Um, the Corps of Engineers has the tool, I should say. Their, their curves are shallower um, for whatever reasons.
but we, we, so we're trying to tell them, here's where you could look for, at the, for a federal kind of guidance, but also you can look locally. And so what our planning organization has done in the area is convene all the cities together. So they're actually discussing this together. So, and that helps because then we can leverage the university expertise. We can bring in a federal agency to talk to 17 municipalities representing, you know, two, three million people. Um, that seems to be a path forward for coastal Virginia as well. Let's have one more question here, I guess, Bill, and then, and then I'm going to invite the other panelists to come forward and we'll just open it all up. So, Bill. Yeah, just, uh, thanks. Um, so just a funny add on, on to the, um, the New York City story. You know, uh, you probably know this, but I mean, you're absolutely right that one of the responses to the blizzard was to sort of put things underground. Then that, that sort of legacy was that a lot of that underground stuff was flooded in Hurricane Sandy. So that's the, uh, um, the added. And people were saying we should put them above ground. That was, that was one of the early responses. But the, the question I had, um, I really, the, you know, the, the example that you gave was great. I mean, the Hampton Roads and the Virginia area. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about, particularly for the maybe um, Nancy and others could, could chime in, but like on the New Jersey shore or Long Island or other parts along the eastern seaboard, what I've seen recently in the last six to 18 months is a sort of a change in risk perception about the concept of sea level rise and the implications of that. And I'm wondering, you know, if you're seeing that and the implications of that for your case and kind of a tag in, you know, is nuisance flooding as an empirical sort of like thing that people can look at, you know, really accelerating people's understanding of climate change and the perception of it? Yeah, it's it, it, you know, for, for a reflection first from having moved back after being away from Hampton Roads for about 10 years, I was in North Carolina and, um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, political uproar in North Carolina, hold back, hold the line and so on. But when I came back, the, the psychology of sea level and flooding has changed. Uh, I would have no problem. You know, I might have a, a 1% issue out there with talking about sea level rise and climate change in Norfolk. And uh, so that, I think on the leading edge because they're experiencing it, there's no denying. Now, when I get into explanations uh, and that, that might be a little more contested or just uh, ignorant, but yeah, we have uh, 60 days of tidal flooding on, on the street. Now there's a, the benchmark that's been call, called nuisance tidal flooding is uh, NOAA has a report that pegs it to a certain street level when you start to see secondary streets flooding. So I'm not sure what, where they actually decide that because there's different streets but each city has a kind of benchmark there and it's a datum. But you know, when is, when is 60, which is nuisance tidal flooding today, then that turns to 200 or 300 days in a couple of decades. That's not a nuisance anymore. That's gondola time, you know, and the implications of that frequent of flooding on infrastructure. Uh, there are streets in Norfolk that the pavement cracks, has salt weathering on it. Uh, the underground is fragmented. Uh, I don't know too much about the subsurface flow, but we found this, this flooding in the middle of the tarmac area. Um, there could be other, certainly residential, other, other types of uh, infrastructure or buildings that are sensitive to it in their foundations. Um, and I read up in, in Venice, for instance, now, how has Venice four or 500 years survived? Even in, if it's evolved way, there's, there's a datum elevation where the foundations of which the, the frequency of flooding is entering bricks in, with a limestone um, component to them that actually pose a, a, a major threat. Okay, um, I'd like to invite Frank and you may to come up and take a seat in the front and, and we'll in, invite um, Tom to sit with them. And actually other, since, since now our, our numbers in the room have dwindled a bit, if anyone in the back wants to come take a seat to, at the table or, or right behind the table just to be closer to a microphone, you're welcome to do that. Um, I think 
we'll open for questions and discussion and, and we'll start with some questions that have come in from our remote listeners and Kara has those. Or, or, or maybe Remy. Uh, so we did receive uh, an earlier question, um, I think directed towards Frank, about um, just kind of thinking generally, if you had any comments on on the changing role of nuclear power within the other aspects that you talked about. Uh, sure. Um... I think you would separate out the U.S. from other parts of the world. So it's very country uh, dependent. So if you're talking about China or Germany or Italy or Sweden or the U.S., um, it would be different. With respect to the United States, um, the industry is on a kind of a, a slow decline for a variety of reasons. Um, the And with very low natural gas prices, and uh, there are many reactors that are shutting down or threatening to shut down because they can't, or they claim they can't earn enough on the wholesale uh, market. At the same time, many states, particularly in the Northeast, not only there, are pushing for 100% clean energy, strong transition to renewables. Um, so as that nuclear fleet keeps dwindling, um, as the reactors get, um, m many of them are at or past their 40 years, they've been extended their license for another 20 or so. It'll be interesting to see uh, how well the renewable transition occurs and uh, if it's quick enough, fast enough, lower cost enough that we don't revisit the extension of these reactors another 20 years and then uh, perhaps even new builds. So in the U.S. it's kind of a slow uh, decline but remember 10 years ago or so, 12 years ago, prior to the natural gas uh, uh, fracking, uh, the nuclear industry was talking about a renaissance. So I had to learn how to spell that word. Um, and now if you said nuclear renaissance, uh, you would, you know, it, don't do it in public, at least in the US. A few um, of our online viewers also exchanged a few messages in our chat, kind of um, thinking about what would happen to a place, um, perhaps on the eastern coast or, or any place where we're storing oil, or if perhaps oil drilling was expanded and a hurricane came through. Are we thinking anything about planning for um, dealing with oil? or any type of oil spill compounded by sea level change and even possible hurricanes? I, I can sp speak to that. Um, you know, Virginia has come out at the municipality level in the legislature and the government across the board opposing offshore uh, energy. And so despite, you know, some maybe silver linings there potentially for some. It's seen as an overweight, overly risky proposition. And on the current uh, landscape in our port, we do have substantial, you know, s storage facilities. Uh, there is still some proposition for a, a LNG gas facility and property that is in a very low lying state. Uh, but I think those things have been slowed to a crawl uh, of late. Now, the, the current um, emergency management regime for managing risk is, is pretty robust in the area, but the future is only increasing risk. So hardening or relocation uh, would have to be put on the table. We had invited an oil speaker um, and she was unable to participate due to some conflicts, but I think so. I think we recognize that in the in the three talks today, and plus Maryland's, that we we did a little short shrift on the oil side, and we we can understand that it's a big part of the concern for uh, coastal flooding. If you if you look at all the places that are ports, 
um, and ports where oil comes in. And, and from you, you may have a photograph of the oil storage tanks outside of Portland, which I think helps us visualize that. Certainly anybody who's ever driven through northern New Jersey to New York City has seen lots of oil storage or petroleum storage right right at kind of at sea level. And um, so I, I think we, we, need, we can all recognize that because ports are where they are, because that's where the coast is, and because um, that's a that's a transitional place for a lot of this shipment, that that that's going to be an important part of our consideration. Um, yeah. Just to add on, I mean, uh, New Jersey not only has oil depots, but also lots of um, hazardous waste sites, just to sort of throw onto the the bucket as well. And this is a, a a wide problem that a lot of those are at low elevation, and so the issue of potential increased uh, leachate from them with sea level rise or other related uh, impacts of climate change, which is a big e environmental justice issue. I'd like to add that uh, in Oregon, there's a proposed LNG export facility in Coos Bay. So it'd be a very low lying spot in about the highest seismic hazard zone and in the tsunami zone, the developers have proposed to, uh, to uh, Put a, put a bunch of land um, uh, engineered fill so that the facility would be above the tsunami zone. Um, and that's been a project that the developers have been trying to build for, uh, I'd say, over 10 years. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is they don't pick on California or Washington State. They pick on Oregon, which has uh, less uh, robust regulation. Uh, we have um, another question online. I'll read through it. It says, how open do you see local government to more assessment digitization, such as GIS mapping and data collection, which leads to better modeling? Local governments rely on grants for activities outside of the main mission of CIP management, yet there are little to no grants that help with GIS data collection of infrastructure. Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that. It's um, one of the things that went away from the 90s. We had this quite a strong explosion, and I, I, I'm sure Andrew will say something about this, but we actually had the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. We had kind of block grants to support that, and uh, you know, GIS has been widely adopted, but one of my perceptions as a researcher is there's still a lack of standardization uh, as far as the structure of municipal data. So uh, Hampton Roads is really uh, a, a patchwork quilt case example uh, where we have 17 municipalities and you, you would struggle to bring together a map of parcels that has the, the attributes replete to do impact analysis. Um, other states, I think North Carolina has like a, a unified parcel information system. Uh, what pointed what the other thing that sort of brought this up uh, some states are doing this is the impact of an, a disaster on changing that problem <laughs> uh, and Hurricane Floyd 1999 hit North Carolina uh, worst natural disaster I think before Florence actually Florence probably topped it uh, they didn't know where all the hog farms were you know some 5,000 of them so that flipped the switch uh, in addition to the, the damage to, you know, uh, residential properties such that North Carolina became the technology leader in the country for flood mapping and to this day still invests millions annually uh, in partnership with FEMA to demonstrate how others should do it. So why aren't the others doing it? I think that was the question. Um, let's hear, Glenn, do you have a, did you have a question that you wanted or a point you wanted to raise? Sure, thanks a lot. First, I want to thank all the speakers from, from Maryland who introduced it to the speakers who are up there now for really excellent presentations. These were really stimulating and there's so many different ways to go. 
But I do want to follow up on something because we were, we're thinking about the impact of rising sea levels. And you may, you suggested is the uncertainty that's causing those things not to be taken into account, maybe as much as seismology. So correct me on a couple of things if I'm wrong. The last time there was a big quake on the Cascadia Fault was about 1700, and that was over eight, and that's based on paleo seismology studies. I can tell you right now that since 1900, sea level has risen between 13 and 20 uh, centimeters, depending on where you are. It's currently raising, rising at a rate of 3.2 millimeters or more. There's no uncertainty in that. I can also tell you that I believe projections for the earthquake along the Cascadia Fault for Portland are somewhere in the ballpark, and correct me if I'm wrong, 12 to 20% probability in the next 50 years. Okay. I can tell you with a pretty much 100% probability, if we continue to increase greenhouse gases, we will have a sea level rise of somewhere between 60 and 160 centimeters at the end of the century. So I don't think it's uncertainty. I don't think it's uncertainty. Consensus. You guys decided that a 9.0 scale quake is what you're going to sort of look at, right, because of consensus. Well, I would say that the consensus is also there in the climate change community, right? So uh, that we will have a rise in sea level. So what is interesting to me is with earthquakes, one that hasn't really rocked you guys since 1700, people don't have the political baggage. You know, people say we got a plan for this. And yet in so many jurisdictions, sea level rise, which is happening today, you can see it and, you know, becomes a hot button issue. That's one question. The other thing was, you guys chose, and this is, a, uh, a, is actually a very valid risk strategy to take a worst case scenario and plan for that. And if you would, I'm sure economists looked at this, if you plan for a less than worst case scenario, the cost of risk from that might be way higher than if you actually say, okay, we're going to invest in the worst case. So my question is, what do you think the difference is in the politics behind this? Why it's okay, you can get people behind earthquake planning, but it's so hard in some jurisdictions to get them behind, let's say, a sea level rise planning. And then how did you get them to accept, we're going to go for a worst case scenario in our planning? Because I think that's a really good strategy, actually. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think with climate change, it has been become so political that you can't backpedal on that. Um, with earthquakes, uh, when we started, you know, people didn't even think they didn't know anything about them. So we really started from ground zero. And the approach that we took, I chaired the Earthquake State Commission back in 1999-2000. Uh, you know, there was quite a lot that needed to be done because our seismic building codes were horrible until the mid-1990s. So uh, everything built before the mid-1990s uh, in the state of Oregon is seismically deficient. But rather than saying, oh, we really need to fix everything and obviously not have enough money and there's the political awareness is very, very low, if not non-existent. We picked schools and emergency response facilities. Schools because our children go there and we, they're mandated to go there and they should be coming home every day, you know. Um, and with emergency response facilities, this is, this, this is something that all communities need. It's the safety net. So we did argue about should we include police stations or not because um, fire stations were an easier sell. Should we include hospitals? Some of them are private, some of them are public. Um, we, uh, you know, we struggled with that, but we, we landed on those because we thought that those were uh, sellable to the public. And over the course of many years, um, we have been building programs. So first we passed laws that said schools need to be safe within a 30-year time frame, seismically safe, and we gave them a longer time frame because their main education, it, their, their main focus is education. We gave emergency facilities a 20-year time frame because they really need to be there for the community. And then we did the scientific thing, we did the statewide uh, assessment of 
well, what is their actual vulnerability and what is the need? So we started with the um, law first, and then a few years later, we established a grant program that provides, as a safety net, funding for retrofits, seismic retrofits for schools and emergency response facilities up to a certain cap. And um, we went to the public and passed ballot measures that said, yes, we need to change the constitution. We did this in you know, a really open way and allowed the public to help make these decisions. And we're on you know, a pretty slow but steady path. Um, can I jump in not about the, the specifics of organ or earthquakes in the 1700s? Um, one thought in terms of, it seems to me, and I think there's some literature on this, that extreme or severe, particularly negative consequences, you can rally people behind. So an earthquake, people can imagine from the movies, from historical, and it's a threat, it's in a shock, versus a slow chronic, um, you know, yeah, a couple millimeters a year, or several millimeters a year, um, frog in the pot, boiling type thing. So that may be something. With respect to the, the strategy of worst case, you know, dealing with the worst case um, and as a risk management strategy, my guess is that's probably not the best strategy efficiently wise. One is I can always imagine a worst case. You pick one give me five seconds i can imagine worst case now that's a little bit silly because you know we kind of kind of the boundaries um it is way of getting motivation because now people can imagine that and people in general aren't really good at risk management and you know uh, revolutionary history wasn't built around small probability high consequence risk it was about getting through the day and that is this, this tough in terms of um uh, of climate change because there's this chronic problem that we've been talking about, but obviously focused a lot on the the more severe stuff. I don't know if that's helpful. I'll take an analogy on that real quickly. Is um, if you were a doctor and you were seeing a patient, uh, you wouldn't ask like, well, you could have this or you could have that or you could it could be you know you could drop out right here <laughs> walking out the out the door. Um, you want to be it's got to be trying to be prescriptive and it's not in my nature as a scientist to kind of do that so um I've, i have seen the turn i think in virginia toward accepting if i don't start talking about uncertainty and the scientific kind of debates and things we might try to be in reducing that but to be more prescriptive and i, I guess i'd say confident but honest about it and um with other hazards is we have them outside of sea level rise. Um, they, they aren't, I would say, tainted is the word. They don't have the fingerprint of the climate change anthropogenic underpinning. And maybe that's a, a little piece of the difference with earthquakes, maybe. Um, we have a question from the floor here. Oh, Remy's all tied in. Here comes the microphone. Uh, Hi, uh, Kari Clark from con the Congressional Research Service. You have given some examples at the local and state level, but I'm, uh, I want to kind of uh, focus it particularly on energy infrastructure. What do you see as next steps of translating some of that data and analysis for local, state, and federal policymakers um, to utilize and to further develop geospatial data to shore up the, uh, the energy structure, energy infrastructure? In terms of uh, energy information, there's the Energy Information Agency, which has come out of nowhere in terms of data to me. And they, they have a lot. I think it could see a lot more use. Um, I think there could be uh, tools or data provided at a finer scale to at the state level uh, toward planning. But what I'm concerned about is the, is the state have the capacities to actually use it? Uh, do they need incentives? Do they need policy, grants, or something to do it? Uh, in emergency management, some states are really good about that. So they've got 
you know, a strong tie-in with uh, Hurricane Center Weather Service and NOAA, but I'm not so sure that con those connections don't seem to be there, in my experience, uh, as well on the geospatial side outside of that. Down the road, and this is maybe a, little, a lot of speculation, with the advent of sensors, machine learning, kind of big data, so forth, Google Maps, um, people writing algorithms to extract information that wasn't originally collected for a purpose like you described, but then trans converting it to one, that may be an area that will help. I don't think it will completely solve by any means some of the issues that, that Tom yeah, raised. Uh, yeah, there may be one other an analogy because the whole shift of retreat and the renewables. So, you know, we're seeing that go offshore, offshore wind. I don't know so much about onshore wind, um, but there are a lot of data portals that actually support the marine offshore wind. And they've, they've done uh, a lot, uh, I think, to sort of spur that uh, from the federal side and the states, the Marco data portal in the mid-Atlantic is pretty excellent. The Southeast, I think, lags a lot behind that one. Uh, but the, the data that you would need to do site planning uh, to do offshore wind energy um, is, is generally there and the portals are there to support it. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that conversation as well. Uh, I was impressed when I was a regulator for TVA for eight years. I uh, was there uh, post Fukushima and I watched, we have seven reactors, how the um, industry got consolidated around an action plan, really a, a set of standards that required greater investment in uh, backup power and in sensors and um, studies of vulnerability to various uh, disasters, um, see if the nuclear plants could ride through. There, were, there was one case where you had to take two at a time, you know, imagine um, you had a uh, flooding and then one of your sandy mountains slid into the river and a subsidence of some sort and you know, can your reactors withstand that? In the nuclear field, there's been, I think, a great amount of energy, a, a great amount of data generated and a tremendous uh, rallying around good practices in the U.S. post Fukushima. I don't see that in um, renewables. Well, let's take solar, for instance. States uh, don't have a standard solar siting um, set of requirements at, at this point. So are states going to be responsible? Who's going to be responsible for um, uh, once, uh, let's say, a uh, solar plant rides through its life 25 years later, what's the requirement for disposing of the debris afterwards once it's uh, no longer generating? It's just a lot of uncertainty in these new fields that have got to get resolved. And, I, and along with that will come better data, um, both um, performance, uh, you know, of the and an EIA is vastly underfunded. If we have some way to make that case <laughs> in whatever we do, Carol, I would love to do that because they uh, play such a key role. They um, have um, data collection survey instruments, you know, that are one of a kind, the only, only uh, source for a lot of data. They collect all of the FERC required data and make it available. You can purchase their modeling tool, the National Energy Modeling System, and you can use it and you can take the, in, the guts of the data inside and use it. There's just a lot that they do and, and yet uh, they've been struggling. So we definitely need um, to consider their enhanced role moving forward, they need to have more, you know, more time of use, more high resolution um, temporal data as well to be useful in better modeling. Uh, that was just a, sorry about us, yay, yay, yay though. <laughs> um, we have another question from the floor here. What happened to our microphone, did it? Yep. Oh yeah, you can pull in up to one of these. 
So um, one quick comment and then one more of a question. Um, the comment is, and I go back to Tom, um, you're, you, you kind of linked renewables with resiliency. Um, and I just wanted to kind of be clear that um, although renewables can contribute to resiliency, um, they're still vulnerable, whether we're talking about onshore or offshore. Um, if you look at images coming out of Puerto Rico, uh, you'll see how solar uh, panels fared in a Cat 5 hurricane. So we shouldn't be under the illusion that renewables and resilience go hand in hand, per se. Um, but with regards to the issue of codes and standards has been has been brought up, I was wondering if the panel could kind of amplify, um, maybe starting with Tom, you mentioned that uh, for the region uh, down in the Norfolk area, I guess there was a sea level standard established, if I recall um, your comments early on in your presentation. Uh, I was wondering if the panel could talk about um, where standards have exist, where they've been developed recently, how they've expressed themselves at a very practical level. You talked about all the things and all the vulnerabilities taking place in the port down there, but how does how has the standard help develop the more resilient port? Uh, and beyond just Norfolk and for the other other panelists, you know, where are we in terms of resilient standards? What where we have them, what role are they playing? And where we don't have them, what efforts are are you observing towards their development? Yeah, for the Hampton Roads area, um, unfortunately, it's still a work in progress. It's literally only like a month ago that the cities have signed this sort of MOU uh, through our Hampton Roads Planning District to uh, agree to follow the same sea level rise projections. Now we have to see where the rubber hits the road with that. So it, it should mean that some real actions take place, such, such as the city's uh, stormwater management uh, utilities are going to have to design uh, their stormwater conveyance systems uh, and other systems to reach a higher level. Um, why that might be a good thing is now Virginia Beach uh, changes its stormwater uh, system or its wastewater treatment plan or whatever, and so it doesn't flood Chesapeake. So um, the cities are so in interconnected that uh, and people work in each in on the other cities, so they have they they are there's an interdependency that we should start to see that prep, uh, infiltrate I guess all the other departments in the cities doing um, these things. Uh, more of the cities have created a resilience officer, so that is still happening. Not all of them have one, and the state created its first resilience officer uh, just about two months ago. So um, I think I heard Oregon, uh, at least maybe some others uh, beat them to that. But we should start to see some alignment across levels of government uh, with that and that sharing. Clarification, though, when you, when you were referring to a sea level standard, uh, it wasn't an engineering design standard. It was a climate scenario standard, or in this case, a sea level rise. So by X point in time, sea level rise would, would increase to Y in terms of your risk assessment. That's that's what was standard. Yeah, pretty much. And um, but that's that's initially a step. Uh, one of the cities can commence a large study of uh, extreme rainfall climatology. So now the other cities can use that. Okay. So there is a nice sharing uh, in a way that's not happened before. But in contrast, it, it isn't as though people have said the sea level rise will come up to this point in time. And if you're going to build infrastructure, you should meet that point or maybe be three feet above that. That kind of standard is a work in progress. No. Yeah, that's a work in progress. Uh, the only thing like truly the Hampton Roads cities uh, collaborate on is uh, wastewater and uh, garbage. Hampton Roads Sanitation District uh, is uh, the, the, the only regional truly government entity. Okay, well, we have um, lots of lots of questions coming here and, and not too much time. So let's um, let's start with Michael. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Marilyn and all our speakers. Really excellent uh, talks. I enjoyed all of them. Um, I, I want to flip our initial question on its head a little bit um, and get your reflections on when, when we're talking about energy grid planning and infrastructure planning. 
How much uh, of the reverse uh, causal pathway is, is being considered? So, for example, the, the most recent wildfires, the devastating ones in California, the likely culprit is poorly maintained um, hydroelectric lines. Uh, it hasn't been proven yet, but there are $19 billion worth of lawsuits pending, as far as I know. So it will be determined. Um, I worked a few years ago on a massive uh, leak in a natural gas storage facility at the Aliso Canyon facility, which is affiliated with SoCal Gas. It was the biggest single methane release in American history from a point source. Also released a, a lot of air toxics. And then as we've seen, hydraulic flat fracturing and other unconventional um, oil and natural gas extraction happening. It's happening much closer into residential areas and then it's being shipped through um, trains and ports which may be vulnerable themselves to all of these other effects that we've talked about. So is that is that message getting across in the planning of the infrastructure that you know the, the grid itself is a major risk for causing or igniting uh, natural disasters or or human-made disasters of, of uh, very large magnitude? Well, um, you know, it's a very interesting question. Certainly as they arise, they do. Um, the industry, like most or if not all industry, perhaps all people or many, very reactive. Again, we have these low probability, high consequence events. So the day before, if it is the case, these hydroelectric lines cause that fire and you or I went in front of whoever and said, hey, this is a risk, it would have been one of, of a thousand. And then after the fact, once it occurs, then it's both visceral and you have the evidence that has occurred. Um, you know, there's a long list of, of risks, uh, you know, sunspots, uh, <laughs> all the way through people shooting at substations. I mean, um, and all, I'm not trying to discount them or say they're not important or whatever. Um, and then once we have at a severe event happened, then after the fact, we close the barn door um, and say never again. And of course it always happens again in a different way. Um, the, so I think that's one of the challenges, which is, which is of the long list of very severe uh, risks, um, uh, but low probability, how do we systematically go through them in, in an anticipatory format as opposed to, okay, a tsunami hit, now we revisit earthquakes in Oregon. And that's, I think, challenging on the intellectual and the scientific side, but also just a matter of policy and politics given all the other priorities running around. Can I say something? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm um, exercising my right as a speaker and an inquester, inquirer, anyway. Um, so we've not talked about the alternative to expanding transmission, distribution, and power generation, which is of course to use our energy more wisely, and that's always the cheapest and the cleanest. And yet it doesn't get the kind of um, <clears throat> attention that it merits in looking at how we can expand our energy infrastructure, because in a sense, it is the alternative. <laughs> That's what, one thing I was trying to show with that description of what you could do in Florida, all of the things you can do in place, much of it is with the existing building and manufacturing plants you have operating you can and with your transmission you can um, rather than put in a new line you can place a load reduction initiative in a particular location and avoid the actual expansion of this infrastructure the inf anything big um, the you know the bigger um, we have these isol uh, investments discrete investments and the larger the generation plants, the greater the, po the greater the cost of a disaster, maybe it's by being a point source, it's uh, not um, as likely as, for a lot of reasons, large scale systems are, however, a magnet, for instance, they're 
uh, potentially vulnerable to um, uh, uh, to um, attack. So the more distributed you have your infrastructure and the less of it you have, <laughs> the less vulnerable you are. So I did see post uh, Hurricane Michael uh, that South Georgia experienced quite a few, you know, some damage to its solar farms. Um, but, you know, if it had been a nuclear plant, it would be a whole other story. So, but the, this, the, it's a very nice geographic question, I think, of how much less vulnerable a system might be if it were distributed with fewer large scale uh, facilities that are both um, you know, naturally more destructive if, if they are in operation and also a magnet for, for, for violence. Let me jump in though, to just kind of push back a little bit. Even if you had all the cost effective, however you want to define it, energy efficiency, you still would need the grid and that situation may have occurred if it was. Yeah. But you might be able to retire a lot of those plants that are in the low lying coastal areas. Sure, you but know, in terms so of the really example helped. of California, if it was these hydroelectric lines poorly maintained that resulted, that triggered the fire, even if you would have had cost effective, all the cost effective energy efficiency, you would still have a grid and you would still have transmission lines who could still be poorly maintained, who could still trigger fires. Well, Secondly, in our lifetime, but maybe not in the century. Yeah, I, I guess well, my understanding of it too is a lot of it's driven by the peak demand. So. When we looked at you know getting rid of I was on this right, but major would be investigation peak demand. on Aliso. There would still be peak demand even if you had all the cost effective yeah, energy. Yeah, so that's, that seems to be a big challenge. Um, Two other quick points. The, the, you know, there was no way to get rid of Aliso Canyon and still ensure that you're going to meet No, but you demand. don't have to have big hydro plants with large transmission lines going into California if you were if you had more solar on the. So the now yeah, let's go state. to that. So it's that combination. So now you have to talk about costs. It's not just solar, it's solar plus storage. Solar and storage won't get you, you still need wind. Wind, you need large scale transmission lines because you have to ship from where there's large amounts of wind onshore or offshore to load centers. So you're still back to the system. Um, doesn't mean those aren't good ideas or they won't help, but you have to consider the additional risk. So I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue these additional initiatives, but we should think, understand how we got to the system we got to and it wasn't based on it was based a variety of things historical factors but also low cost efficient we can move electricity very efficient long distance as well so i haven't yet seen kind of the full-blown distributed generation uh, society in terms of the actual cost numbers but if it's using technologies available today, the cost will go through the roof. Yeah, but you Maybe know, you would never, you wouldn't displace an operating. It's very unlikely that an existing well-operated gas plant would be shut down now or anytime in the near term to move into solar or wind. That's my point. But, so but my point is that you would, it eventually these retiring plants will either not be needed or will be displaced with something different. And that's where we have an opportunity for greater, greater dispersion of our infrastructure. Right. <laughs> we're out of time. And, and wouldn't you know, we're getting, you know, we have a lot of people with questions and ideas and comments and all of a sudden we're stimulated, it's heated us up and we are at, at, we're just past five o'clock. So I think we should um, thank again our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> Including Marilyn. And um, maybe those of us in the room can continue to ask a, a few questions, but I think as we're walking out, but um, thanks to everyone who joined us from wherever. And there's plenty, obviously plenty more to be said on this topic, and we're going to um, work on that for a while. So thank you very much for joining us.